We're in Florida for today's case, so you know it's gonna be fucked up, you know? Yeah, Florida people. It is June of 1989. We are out in the Tampa Bay waters, like literally in the water of Tampa Bay, near the Skyway Bridge, if you're familiar with the area. And a sailor calls into the Coast Guard to report a body floating in the water. Now this isn't extremely abnormal. Um, if a boat goes under, if a swimmer gets pulled in, bodies, you know, turn up in large bodies of water. It's not extremely abnormal, but it's normally, obviously, an accident, okay? But on this day in particular, three bodies of three different women are found floating in the Tampa Bay, all at around the same area. All three bodies are found one after another. All three had been weighed down with cinder blocks and all three were unclothed from the waist down, okay? They'd been tied behind their backs by their wrists, their ankles were tied. They all had signs of strangulation because there was like cord wrapped around their necks and to the Coast Guard and to the sailors who found these bodies. I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's a shock, a nightmare. The women found obviously don't have any kind of identification on them. And on the scene, the Coast Guard's biggest fear is that these women are here on vacation. This was the Sunday after Memorial Day weekend. So if these women were from out of town, it would be extremely difficult to identify them. But because of the similar state that all three bodies were found in, they knew that it was very well connected. And it also seemed that all three of the bodies had spent the same amount of time in the water. So it all happened at the same time, okay? And so the bodies go unidentified for about a week at a local hotel. When one of the housekeepers, she realizes that she has been cleaning a room that's been pretty much undisturbed for the past couple of days. It seems like every time she comes back into the room, everything is exactly how it was the day before. Nothing had been changed. It was no new messes. Like the room had just been abandoned with all of these people's, you know, belongings still inside. And the room isn't in disarray or anything like that. It's just completely untouched. The room was registered to a woman by the name of Joan Rogers. Joan had been traveling to Florida with her daughters, Chris and Michelle, who were 14 and 17 at the time, okay? Joan and her kids were from Ohio and they were visiting Florida to go to Disney, okay? Now the room Joan was staying in, it was registered with her home address, her phone number, but before calling Joan's home and disturbing her family, they pull fingerprints from the room and match them to the bodies they found, okay? So the fingerprints that are found in the room that's registered to Joan match the three women that were found in the bay. Now back home, Joan's husband and the father of her children had been looking for them. He had been calling in to see if there were some unreported accidents because he couldn't get a hold of his girls. So the father, Hal Rogers, didn't participate. He didn't go on the trip because they owned dairy cows and he kind of like ran the dairy cow farm on his own. So he just could not take that type of time off to go on a road trip from Ohio to Florida. And authorities from Florida send authorities in Ohio to relay this information to Hal, okay? Hal and Joanne were high school sweethearts, inseparable. They got married and started their family, had their two daughters, and were living a pretty quiet life in a small town. And unfortunately, Hal is the only member of this family left. After the bodies are confirmed to be the girls through an autopsy, the autopsy also shows that 
the women were strangled. That's why the cord was around their neck, but they weren't dead when they went into the water, so they all drowned. The autopsy also proves that all three women were sexually assaulted before being thrown overboard. And they know that the women were like thrown off of a boat and not just like dumped into the water because of how far out the bodies were found. Like the way the current was, if they were dumped like at a shoreline, the bodies would have come back to shore and drifted back to shore. Does that make sense? So the bodies were brought up to the shore in St. Petersburg, even though they were found in the Tampa Bay. So St. Petersburg police dealt with this triple homicide, okay? And because this was just a lot of work to be done, a whole team is assigned to the case and they get to work. They find the car abandoned at a boat ramp not very far away from the women's hotel. So this is kind of like their first lead and they begin to dissect the vehicle and see what kind of information they can get from the car. So because the car was parked in the boat ramp and then inside of the car, they find film that they have developed and the last couple of pictures on this film is the girl's dressed in the bathing suits that they were found in so they're thinking that they went on somebody's boat willingly happily in bathing suits planning on having a good time but something devious happened after that so inside the car they also find brochures things of that nature disney brochures souvenirs from their trip and then they also find some like, mar not markings, but like notes written down. There's directions to their hotel written down. And then there's something about a blue and white boat written down. So maybe whatever happened to them happened to them on a blue and white boat. They also send detectives to Ohio to question how, but like, how the hell is hell supposed to be involved in this? All the way, please, and for please, make this make sense. But I guess they just have to, you know, dot their I's, cross their T's. They also talked to some people in the area just to get a feel for the family. And what they realized, unfortunately, is like this trip was like an escape, getaway, like reset trip for the girls, okay? So Hal had a brother who helped him out on the dairy farm, okay? This brother's name was John and John had been sexually assaulting a local girl in the area multiple times, okay? And after this girl came forward and they busted John for this sexual assault, they found pictures of him doing the same thing to another girl. This other girl was Michelle, Hal and Joan's daughter, okay? And they didn't find this out until, you know, he had got crossed up with, with the first girl, all okay? right? Then John went to jail and Hal had bailed him out, okay? So this trip was like a getaway, escape, reset for the girls after everything they had been through. And once John was bailed out, he went to go live with he and Hal's parents in a trailer in Tampa. So to detectives, this doesn't seem like a coincidence. The women go missing and find and wind up murdered in the Tampa Bay. They wonder if Hal had set this up while he was in Tampa, even though at the time of the crime he was incarcerated but ultimately detectives rule John out, even though this is just a weird, crazy, messy situation because Joan and the girls didn't have a set place to stay. They were kind of just moving around and staying in whatever hotel was closest while they were traveling, okay? 
they didn't have like one hotel booked for the entirety of the time and you could pinpoint their location they pretty much bounced around the whole trip so like a murder for hire type situation would be too difficult to coordinate Hal's behavior was also strange to detectives after the murder he a did not want to identify the bodies which to me is reasonable he didn't want to see the girls that way he didn't want that image in his head he also refused to get the girls tombstones to mark their graves Hal says he just couldn't deal with like the finality of that like marking their graves with the tombstone just made things too real for him so that's why he decided not to do so and you know just in town the rumor mill was swirling because of the things that had happened previously with the family with John okay Hal had also taken out a lot of money out of the bank he had withdrawn like seven thousand dollars and detectives were wondering if he was going to use this money to flee but Hal says he took this money out because he was going to go you know look for his daughters himself before the bodies were discovered so ultimately they wrap up their investigation in ohio believing that whoever had done this you know was not connected to the family that this was just a random attack and then after being cleared Hal made his way to florida and he had sailors take him out to where his family's body was found where the bodies were found in the water and he laid flowers out for his girls in the ocean so police come back to florida and basically just start looking for people with boats that match the description they're eventually able to get a little bit of a lead when they put two and two together um, someone else had reported being sexually assaulted on a boat around the time that the women were murdered but this happened in a different county these women they were canadian in florida for a holiday met a man on madeira beach who offered them like a free sunset cruise hey come drive out into the ocean with me we'll watch the sunset from the water it'll be beautiful a perfect way to end your trip okay now he offered this to a group of women only one of the women went which is crazy to think about i couldn't even imagine being on a girl, girl's trip and one of my friends is like hey i'm about to go out on a boat with this man i would literally handcuff her to the bed call 911 call her mom and her dad before i let her do something crazy as hell like that but the one woman who did go out on the boat with this man was s aid and he threatened to throw her overboard with duct tape around her mouth if she didn't keep quiet and the rogers girls were also found with duct tape over their mouths and upon further inspection this woman said that she was on a blue and white boat okay so this is a huge lead for detectives and luckily this first victim also gave a composite sketch so the composite sketch turns up a few leads but they exhaust all these leads without coming up with a full-blown suspect and this leads the case to stall until may of the next year when detectives decide to reassign the case put some fresh eyes on it and bust it wide open look at it from top to bottom again what this new fresh set of detectives realizes is that on the little scribbles that they have on their brochures that we've been talking about some of the scribbles are directions to the hotel that the women last stayed in where all their belongings were found that we talked about in the beginning and this detective wonders you know if this is one of the girls handwriting you know if they took these directions down by ear or if they handed this paper to somebody and got directions from someone else and if the person who gave them directions was the person who invited them out on this boat then they had this person's handwriting and it doesn't take them long to figure out that this is not the girl's handwriting okay the directions to the hotel were given by a mystery person 
and maybe this person was their suspect. So the brochure that has all these little notes on it, okay, is also a brochure that has a map. There is an X marks the spot on the map when they look into it. It's a McDonald's. And this McDonald's is right off of the interstate. And so they're thinking maybe they got lost or took this exit by mistake, stopped this McDonald's and asked for directions. So they hold on to this information for a while, this handwriting, seeing if, you know, it garners any leads on its own, if they can come up with the suspect and then match it to the handwriting after the fact. Like this is the only piece of evidence that they possibly have. So they don't wanna like jump the gun on it, okay? But eventually the case stalls. And so this brings us up until about three years after the murder, the case is still stalling. So what detectives decide to do is put the handwriting up on a billboard. Do you know whose handwriting is, this is? This is possibly the handwriting of a murderer. If you know whose handwriting this is, call us. Okay, so this brings us to July 31st of 92. This is where the nosy neighbors, shout out to all the nosy <laughs> neighbors, no, just kidding, comes in a lady by the name of Joanne, who had been following the triple murder very closely because she thought when the composite sketch came out, it looked like one of her neighbors, okay? Now, 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 Miss Joanne was suspicious of this neighbor because he would be walking around the neighborhood walking his dog, but it seemed like he would always stare a little bit too long at the women in the neighborhood, okay? Kind of giving peeping Tom. So she had been following this murder because she thought the composite sketch looked like somebody she knew, but she didn't want to be, you know, accusatory. But now three years later, they've got some handwriting coming out and she's like okay maybe this is our guy so she starts doing some detective work of her own so joanne got with one of her neighbors who had work done by this man like contracting work so she figured you know if they if they contracted this man out there was probably checks signed paperwork write-ups like markups mock-ups something with his handwriting on it okay so she asked the neighbor if they have any of this paperwork and they do and joanne feels like the handwriting on this paper mark paperwork matches the handwriting on the billboard now this man's name is oba chandler okay and he had signed some paperwork for the neighbors he had done work with with a big old C and this big old C was the same big old C that was up on this billboard so Miss Joanne takes this info to the police but they're not taking her seriously they have a huge 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 pile of leads to go through and so she has to like threaten them and be like hello open your eyes this is the only lead you need like, if everything else y'all got going on, this is it, okay? And so she forces them to take a look at her information, and they're like, oh, shit. Oba Chandler is a contractor. He does aluminum work. He is a father of nine children with eight baby mamas and has been in and out of jail, baby, in and out, in and out. He had been arrested 22 times before even turning 18. This is just his juvenile record, 22 times. And then 18 arrests after that. So 40 arrests at 45 years old. That's more than one arrest every year. Anyway, child, and he also owned a blue and white boat yeah and he had also moved out of tampa shortly after the murders and luckily because of the moderna beach sexual assault victim she's still alive the lady from canada they go to canada with a photo lineup and they see if she can pick oba out of a lineup and she does mm -hmm, she does this is enough for them to arrest oba which is exactly what they want they want to be able to pin him to the moderna beach sexual assault 
put him in jail and build a case against him for the three murders of the Rogers girls while he's sitting tight in prison, okay? So Oba Chandler is convicted and jailed for the Madura Beach sexual assault, okay? And then the prosecution takes two years to build a case against him for the Rogers girls and then he goes on trial for that as well. He does not confess. He pleads not guilty. He never confesses up to what he did. Um, he's found guilty, obviously, and sentenced to death. Because Oba Chandler never confessed, the prosecution was left to theorize what happened to the girls. So the exit that led the girls to the McDonald's is a really tricky, busy exit that they believe the girls took by mistake and pulled over at the McDonald's for directions. And unfortunately, they ran into Oba Chandler. Now, Oba Chandler was also from Ohio. And it's hard to say, maybe he was a familiar face. Maybe Joan had met him before somewhere and he was vaguely familiar to her or maybe he was a complete stranger. We just don't know, but they believe that he was the one who gave the girls the directions. And then later that same day, there was a payphone call made to Joan's hotel room. So they think Oba Chandler called the hotel to check on them, maybe to see if they were traveling alone to get more information on their stay, like who they were with, where they were going, etc. You know, just to scope out his victim. And then after realizing that the girls were alone and they were gonna be alone for the remainder of their trip, he invited them out onto the boat. And once he got them, you know, far enough out into the water, he turned on them. But the girls were thrown out of the boat one by one in different locations and the youngest daughter he held her for the longest and dumped her body out the furthest maybe she was the intended target from the beginning we just don't know there's no how why what happened because he never confessed to doing so and we can only just assume that he was a sick fuck you know i think that's the clear common conclusion then on November 16th, all the way in 2011, is when he is executed. Hal attended the execution and he said, dying by lethal injection was not enough for someone who did what he did. And I agree. today's case we're in memphis tennessee but y'all know memphis kind of borders mississippi it's, memphis is kind of like tucked up in the corner of a couple of states you know but we'll be back and forth from memphis to mississippi it is april 18th 1996 okay on the night of the 18th we are at the home of shannon and robert Sanderson okay Shannon and Robert are getting ready to go out because the 18th is Robert's birthday and they are getting dressed up getting ready to go out to head to the casino this is a picture of Robert and Shannon you can see there is an age gap okay so Shannon is 26 Robert is 59 this is his 59th birthday and as they're getting ready to head out, Robert is surprised by his daughters. <clears throat> so they show up with, you know, cake and things in hand, gifts to surprise their father for his birthday. And once his daughters get there, like, he doesn't want to go out. He doesn't want to go to the casino. He wants to spend time at home with his family, okay? But Shannon has her mind and her heart set on going to the casino that night. They were headed to the Sam's Town Casino in Tunica, Mississippi, which is still open, but it's called a gambling hall. I'm not sure what the difference between a casino and a gambling hall is. I'm sure it's some type of like <clears throat> legality situation I don't know I know casinos in Louisiana are just very different and like just it, casino laws in Louisiana are just different from everywhere else so Robert has his daughters Shannon has her children she has three kids that are in the home with she and Robert so she finishes getting ready she scoops up her kids to drop them off before heading to the casino she drops them off with their father's parents okay so her 
ex-husband's parents. The ex-husband actually lives at the home too. He's getting ready to go out for work. He works overnight. So she leaves her kids with their grandparents and then she heads the about an hour drive to Sam's Town Casino, okay? And I personally would have been crying, screaming, and throwing up if Shannon was my wife and she was going out to the casino by herself because she is gorgeous. I would be sick as a dog. I'm sure Robert Woods. So Shannon makes it to the casino. She plays blackjack. That's her game. She's doing really well. She has a great night. And then she heads back to where her kids are, the home of the grandparents. And this is where shit gets true crimey, okay? Just before 5 a.m. that morning, the next morning, so the morning of the 19th, back at the kids' grandparents' home where Shannon was headed to, their grandfather is woken up by his dogs barking. They're going nuts, okay? So Shannon's ex-father-in-law, I guess you could say, he gets up to see what's going on. He says he peeks out of his front door just to see what he can see. He says he can see Shannon at her car, but he can't see much. Like he doesn't really, he can't get a full view of what's going on. Um, he just assumes like, you know, she's been out at the casino, she's stumbling in, you know, she'll be fine. But then he says he hears like arguing and some kind of commotion, but he's not dressed. So he goes to throw some clothes on and then come back out. But by the time he makes it back outside, Shannon is gone. There's nobody else out there. It's just her car with her car door open. No signs of Shannon, okay? He walks out to the end of the driveway. He looks around just to like get his bearings to see what's going on, to see if he can see anybody, to see if he can see her somewhere. He calls out to her, but she she's nowhere to be found. Um, he's alarmed because Sharon was wearing like a pink press-on nail. One of her press-on nails were in the driveway. She was also wearing one of those like chunky 90s like blazer type jackets with the big buttons hanging off the sleeves. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Um, one of the buttons to her jacket was also found in the driveway. So of course he calls police immediately. So as the sun rises, detectives are being called out. People are assessing the crime scene, crime scene tape. And obviously there's all hands on deck because he heard the arguing. Her vehicle is found with the doors wide open, her press-on nail in the driveway, a button to her jacket in the driveway. She's gone. It seems like she was snatched up. And there are suspicions of her being kidnapped or soon confirmed because her father-in-law or ex-father-in-law wasn't the only person, you know, woken up by the commotion. Multiple neighbors, after they saw the crime scene tape, you know, approached and said, you know, we were also woken up by the commotion. She was arguing with somebody and we saw someone pick her up and throw her into the back of their car and drive off. So detectives are like, well, shit, you know, this is definitely an active kidnapping situation. This person stood out because he was wearing a bright red baseball cap, okay? He had on a denim jacket and the car he was driving was also maroon. So he just kind of stuck out. But nobody approached, so nobody could see this man's face. Nobody could identify him. So Robert Sanderson, her husband that she's supposed to go out with that night is obviously their first suspect, mainly because her ex-father-in-law assumed that they were together. He didn't know that they didn't go together. And when he heard the arguing in his driveway, he assumed that it was her and her husband. They had been married for just about a year. Shannon had actually worked for Robert Sanderson. Robert Sanderson owned a multi-million dollar company. He did alarm systems, kind of like at the peak, you know, when everybody was first getting the alarm system. When that market just started popping up, she worked for him, he fell in love, and then they got married. And it seems like there was a little overlap in um, the relationship. Like Shannon was still married to her kid's father when she met Robert Sanderson, divorced her kid's father, and then got married to Robert Sanderson soon thereafter. And you know, everybody's gonna judge, but I just feel like if you could be married to a millionaire or you could be married to a regular, regular person, love just ain't enough, okay? I would rather be rich. I can love anybody, but that's just me. 
and Robert doesn't have much of an alibi. He says, you know, he was at home with his daughters. They brought a birthday cake to celebrate his birthday. Then after that, he was just at home alone asleep. But we know that she was out late, so it's pretty, you know, fair that Robert could have met up with her later on. Maybe he drove out to the casino after his daughters left. So detectives' next step is to go to the Sam's Town Casino Gambling Hall, whatever, because y'all know security cameras and casinos here, there, everywhere, okay? So they would have a very good idea of her time at the casino, who she was talking to, who if she was with anybody, like everything. They just needed to go check out the casino. But because we're going from state to state, the FBI does get involved, and from here on out, we're gonna be working with Tunica Police, Memphis Police, and the FBI. It's like a joint effort. So from security footage and just from the workers who worked at the casino that night, they learned that Shannon had a great night at the casino. She had got there at about 7 p.m. and had left, and had left around 3.30. Remember, it's about an hour drive to and from the casino. But at the casino, she played blackjack all night and she was winning big. She had won like $5,000 in 1996, okay? So she was doing great. She had a beautiful night at the casino. But the whole time she was there alone. And she left the casino with $5,000 in like straight cash money. And they talked to security at the casino. Um, because she won so much money, she was escorted out directly to her car, in your car, turn it on, drive off before security, you know, leaves your side to make sure you make it to the car safely. Like it would be very bad publicity, I guess you could say, for the casino. If, you know, you won a bunch of money and then you got jacked in the parking lot, you know, so they take it super serious at casino. So she's escorted out. Um, the security guard says there's nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, it's just a regular, regular night. And when Shannon drove off from the casino, she was perfectly fine and alone, okay? So they don't have much from the security footage. They don't have an ID of this person from neighbors. So they're really kind of stuck until they get a phone call into their tip line from a woman named Sharon Powers. Okay, so it's a totally different woman, somebody else's wife, and she's calling in about her husband. Now her husband's name is Gerald, Gerald Powers. So Sharon lives in Clarksdale, Mississippi which is about 45 minutes away from Tunico, where the casino is. And Sharon Power says on the night that Shannon disappeared, the night that she was kidnapped, her husband, Gerald, went to the casino. He was wearing a bright red baseball cap. And Sharon says that her vehicle, she drove a Beretta, was maroon and matched the description that she had seen on the news. So obviously right away, this is a lot for detectives and they head to Clarksdale, Mississippi to get a formal interview from Sharon about her husband. So they go out to talk to Sharon and for whatever reason, they feel like Sharon is not a credible witness. They feel like she is just trying to get over on her husband and don't take her claims seriously. Um, partially because she doesn't have any information outside of the information that she told detectives on the phone. He went to the casino that night, he had on the red baseball cap, a denim jacket, and the car was similar to her car, but like that's it. So they move on, they move on. They check this lead off the list and move on. But they pass up this lead mainly because there is a witness that comes forth that says Robert Sanderson was the person in the maroon Beretta. She said she didn't think anything of it at first, but on the night of the kidnapping, she saw Shannon's car pass by, headed to pick up the kids, which she saw Shannon headed to the home on several different occasions. She was familiar with the family, familiar that Shannon was in and out picking up her kids. She saw Shannon and then she saw the maroon color Beretta very close behind her and it was Robert. 
And then her ex-father-in-law also said that he heard Robert or he thought it was Robert. So this all put in Robert himself at the crime scene. Robert also isn't very much cooperating with the investigation. He distances himself, even though this is his wife. He also refuses to give pictures to the press when they ask for pictures to put her face on the news or for um, posters, missing posters. He does not participate in any of that. And then on top of all of that, he does not have an alibi. So they're looking into Robert and Robert basically tells them, okay, y'all looking into me, but y'all need to switch this thing, flip it and reverse it because Shannon had a stalker. And this man's name is Brett Muskamp. Now, Brett Muskamp, she had dated, Shannon had dated briefly in between her ex-husband and Robert, okay? But he was crazy. He was stalking her. She had to get a restraining order. Um, he still wouldn't let up even after, after the restraining order went into place. He had actually written a letter to Robert Sanderson begging him not to marry Shannon because she was like the love of his life. You can't marry her like that's my wife. Then they go to talk to Brett Muskamp and nobody can find him. They go to Brett's employer. They find out that Brett was absent, no call, no show from work the day after the kidnapping, okay? And they go to his home, he's not there. Is he fleeing? Is he in the wind? Is he in Mexico? Nobody knows. But eventually, Brett walks into the police station on his own, like, hey, I heard y'all was looking for me. Here I go. Here I go. Um, and he denies, 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 and he offers to take a polygraph test. They give him a polygraph test, he passes. But he also does not have an alibi for the night of the kidnapping. He says he was at home asleep. Everybody was just at home asleep, which in the middle of the night makes sense. But child, nobody has an alibi. They also question Shannon's baby daddy, her ex-husband, the father of her kids. Um, but he was at work. He was clocked in at work. He has a very solid alibi, even though their relationship was not the best. He didn't have any motive to kill her. Detectives question him about like, you know, the finances and that kind of thing because he was living with his parents. He was a blue collar guy and he was paying child support to Shannon for the three kids even though she had married a wealthier man, which still to me makes sense. I mean, this man has money, but it's not his job to take care of your kids. So he was kind of salty about that, but he wasn't salty enough to kill somebody and he was at work. But Shannon also has other men in her life, a couple of affairs, things of that nature going on. So that is the detective's next course of action. The next set of people they look into are the other men that she had dealings with. So this next man on their list, his name is Brian Maher. He bagged groceries at the local grocery store and that's how he and Shannon had met. Now, they're just kind of dotting their I's and crossing their T's with Brian because he is underage. So they don't think he would necessarily be capable of a kidnapping. But Brian says they had just recently broke up, like two or three days before she disappeared. She ended the relationship, if you could call it that. But he says like there was no bad blood. He was upset that they broke up, but not violent, violently upset. And they also give Brian a DNA test and he passes. The only person that hasn't taken a polygraph test is Robert and he just refuses to do so. Like I said, he stops cooperating with the investigation altogether. They also wonder with Robert, because he is a man with money, if this was like some type of murder for hire situation, they pull his bank statements to see if he had had any irregular large withdrawals. They also pull his phone records to see if he had been talking to anybody that he normally didn't talk to very often, you know, that kind of thing, but nothing comes from it. They don't find anything suspicious or unusual in his bank statements or in his phone records. And all this time, you guys, Remember that Shannon was just a missing person. That is until May 9th, 1996, about 20 days after she was abducted. So we're about an hour and some change outside of Memphis on like some ab abandoned 
farmland that was being surveyed and looked over because the man who owned the property had passed away okay so they're finally about to sell get rid of this land after this man who wouldn't let it go passed away um there's a big shed on the property as the people surveying the land approach the shed there is a smell coming from the shed they approached thinking that an animal must have crawled underneath the shed and passed away it's been here for so long empty but um when they enter the shed they find a body and right off the bat they assume that this is shannon she's the only woman missing in the area her face has been all over the news but obviously the body is still brought in to medical examiners for a thorough autopsy and identification. <clears throat> the body is found outside of Memphis, but remember I said Memphis borders Mississippi. So we're in Mississippi, that's where the body's found. And because of that, the body is taken into Mississippi coroners, okay? The body was quickly identified as Shannon Sanderson. Um, she had suffered from one gunshot to the back of the head. That was her cause of death. But she was also beaten up pretty badly. She was missing teeth. Her cheekbone was broken, presumably from whatever struggle that happened forcing her into this vehicle. Now they have the body, but they don't have anything else. No other leads. Until May 22nd, so just after the body is found, some ish goes down at the Mexico-Texas border. A maroon Beretta trying to go through the Border Patrol checkpoint puts it in reverse, flips around, and darts off in the opposite direction. Obviously, at the border, this is very weird and suspicious, so police dart out after him. They pull him over, lights flashing, regular regular traffic stop, but the person driving the maroon Beretta gets out of the vehicle with a machete. And luckily because the FBI was involved because we crossed state lines between Memphis and I was about to say Memphis to Tennessee, Memphis and Mississippi. When he tried to cross the border and pulled out a machete, he was attacking a federal agent. So everything is loop de loop pulled and connected. So when they arrest him for pulling this machete out on this federal agent, they see that he's also connected to a murder in Memphis. And not only is he connected to this murder, but the body was found just two days before he tried to cross the border. And luckily for detectives, because he's arrested during a traffic stop, they have this vehicle, it's impounded, and they're able to search the vehicle, process it like a crime scene, all of the things. So they process the car, they find black fibers, from an outfit that they think are from the outfit Shannon was wearing when she was abducted. They send it over to the FBI for analysis. That takes some time. They also decide to double back to see at the Samstown Casino, the surveillance footage, if they can see Gerald Powers in the surveillance footage. In the surveillance footage, they catch Gerald Powers on her heels, but always a few seconds or a minute behind her specifically when she went to go cash out and specifically when she left the building with security about a minute passed before Gerald followed, okay? And he was kind of on her heels the whole night as soon as he put eyes on her and realized, you know, that she was winning big. And if they would have listened to this lady the first time around, it wouldn't have took all this other stuff. And robbing someone at the casino that night was like his plan from the beginning. That's why he was there. The whole reason he was there to rob. So the black fibers found in his car are matched to Shannon's outfit. They see him on the security footage. They also find Shannon's jewelry that he had stolen off of her person um, behind a bar and a couch and he had told his wife that he had put it there. And so she relayed this information to detectives. Finally, they were taking her story seriously and deeming her credible. They got more information from her, so about the jewelry. And then she told detectives that Gerald Powers had her sons take his vehicle out and clean it top to bottom, inside and out after the abduction. The case goes to trial 
of course, Gerald was sentenced to death, obviously, slam dunk of a case, um, 10 days before Christmas in 1998. And Gerald was a Virgo. And you would think as a Virgo, he would plan this out a little bit better, but he did not. And the death sentence, God, it's just not enough to ask me. Three kids that have to grow up without a mother, like there's no rectifying that. I also really don't understand why he felt the need to kill her outside of the fact that he just wanted to because she was married to a man with money. All she had won was $5,000. She probably would have handed that over and her jewelry with not much pushback. You know what I'm saying? And then I was watching an episode of Poor Minds a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about how like mean and aggressive broke men are and that is so true like what is it about not having money that makes men so <laughs> violent there's an important trial going on right now that's not being covered very much by the media so i'm going to fill you in on what's going on so the men above me, Matthew Collins, Christopher Burbank, Timothy Ranking, are all Tacoma police officers who are being tried for the death of Manny Ellis. Manny Ellis is a 33-year-old black man who was killed in Tacoma, Washington in March of 2020. Manny died three months before George Floyd and the situations are very similar. What we know right now is that police have lied time and time again and it's taken a huge effort by Manny Ellis' family to actually get the truth about what happened that night. And thanks to his sister in particular who was able to find video footage and eyewitnesses, we now have a better idea of what happened. Officers initially claimed that Ellis walked past their patrol car, began beating on it, and then attacked them. What we now know to be true is that Manny Ellis was walking home from a convenience store. He walked past the patrol car and Officer Burbank opened his door, hitting Manny, knocking him down. Police officers then attacked Manny, beating him, tasing him, also putting him into a chokehold for a very long time, and then eventually hog tying him, including putting a spit mask over his face. While hog tied with Officer Ranking's full weight on his back, uh, Ellis has was heard multiple times saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Officers not only told him to shut the F up, but they also went as far as to say, if you're talking to me, then you can breathe just fine. Unfortunately, he wasn't just fine. And by the time that uh, emergency personnel got there, they could not revive him. Despite this entire situation, all three officers are still on paid leave from Tacoma Police Department. Aside from getting Manny Ellis and his family the justice that they deserve, this case is the biggest single prosecution of police officers for an on-duty death since the 1930s in Washington State. This is also the first time that a state attorney general and not local prosecutor has brought a case like this to trial in Washington State history. Initiative 940 is a new law within Washington State. It's a police accountability law that makes it so that prosecutors don't have to show malicious intent when it comes to officers hurting or killing someone on duty. And so this is the first time it's ever, ever been used. So this case is one that we have to be paying attention to because not only is it gonna set the tone for Washington State, but that's gonna reverberate across the US. This trial is supposed to go into December, so I'll keep you updated on everything that's unfolding. Earlier this week, we heard testimony from the EMT who rendered help to Manny Ellis the night that he died. Now, that EMT stated that in his professional opinion, Manny Ellis died from excited delirium. He made this statement multiple times throughout his testimony, even though a forensic pathologist, a cardiologist, and state medical examiners all said Manny Ellis died from a lack of oxygen due to physical restraint. But this EMT, with six months of EMT training, has decided that his professional opinion is that he died, died from excited delirium. 
Earlier this month, California said, yo, y'all can't use excited delirium as a cause of death, especially when it comes to police brutality cases and excessive force uh, cases. And the reason that they decided this is because the American Medical Association, along with Emergency Medical Association and other medical professionals have said, this is not an actual diagnosis. This is a description of behaviors, not an actual diagnosis. And so excited delirium is these behaviors are superhuman strength and people who are immune to pain, uh, aggressive behaviors in, in people. Now, I feel like you can read between the lines and you can see the similarities between these descriptors and various other ways black and brown people have been described in cases around excessive force and the defense team for these officers is going the exact same route. And so they want us to believe that excited delirium caused Manny Ellis to have a heart attack due to an enlarged heart and because he had drugs in his system. But again, what we know and what many, many medical professionals have already said is that this is not a real diagnosis. But again, the EMT who testified he feels that in his professional opinion, with his six months of EMT training, no shade to EMTs, that Manny Ellis died of excited delirium, something that is not even a real diagnosis. Now, what did come from his testimony that was very interesting to me, and I'm sure it'll be very interesting to the jury as well, is that he was called back by the police to do a blood draw and also do a temperature check after Manny Ellis was already declared dead and they had already left. He actually declined to do a blood draw because that is not typical. They are not typically asked to do that. And he said, he stated that he did not feel comfortable doing that. They did go back to do a temperature check. So they did a little armpit temperature check, um, but they did not do the blood draw, even though they were called back to do so, something that is very, very non-standard. So that's something that we should be questioning right now. Now, as a reminder, the officers who murdered Manny Ellis are still on Tacoma PD's payroll. Citizens have spent over a million dollars uh, on these officers because they have been on paid leave since this happened in 2020. Now, as stated in my last video, this trial would not be where it was or is without Manny Ellis's family and also Tacoma Action Collective. So there is a link in my bio that has a link to uh, a post that Tacoma Action Collective act created uh, as ways that you can support Manny Ellis's family and support the trial during this time. This case is actually being amplified on uh, YouTube, so you can watch it live. Also, the family has a GoFundMe up because they're incurring a lot of cost trying to be at this trial every single day. I mean, and that's also not even considering all of the harassment that they've dealt with. So those are ways that you can support them. I'm gonna continue to follow this case. Um, the NAACP, AOW, Alaska, Oregon, and Washington is also following this case, and we'll keep you updated on what else is happening. One of y'all tagged me in that last night and it's crazy to me that these kind of things happen and we just have no idea. I had no idea that this happened, that this was going on, that there was a trial going on. Um, I will keep up with the trial. Most importantly, I will list the links to the resources that she listed for his family in the description of this video, the GoFundMe, the other website she linked. I'll have all those links in the description of this video so you guys can check them out. But this is just did y'all know that this was happening? Because I just had no idea. But that is a wrap on today's case. As always, leave your thoughts, comments, and opinions in the comments down below. How are we feeling about this one? Make sure you subscribe to the channel if this was your first time here. And I'll see you next time. Bye, guys. But anyway, we're going to hop straight into today's case today's case is another case that starts right after the super bowl 2011 and for today's case we are back in florida with the bullshit okay it's february 7th 2011 
and we are in Clewiston, Florida. So, but on the morning of the 7th, the morning after the Super Bowl, Gloria Vassal wakes up and she realizes that her daughter, Erica, never came home from the Super Bowl party she was attending. So Erica was Gloria's last daughter. She had nine kids. Erica was the youngest. And Erica was 21 years old, so she was just like getting into like that party phase, allowed to stay out a little bit later than she had been the past few years, you know what I'm saying? She wasn't home that morning and nobody had heard from her. Her not being home yet was not completely out of the ordinary. She had a boyfriend that she would spend the night with from time to time. And she also had a brother whose girlfriend she was super close to and she would stay the night over there sometimes as well. As time passes and she still hasn't shown up, they start calling in to her friends to see if anybody had an idea of where she was at, but nobody had seen Erica. The nighttime comes, she still hasn't turned up, and so her family wakes up the next morning on the 8th and they go in to report her missing. Because this was just extremely unlike her. She was very bright, responsible, smart. She was actually in school for nursing. She had won a beauty pageant title called Miss Brown Sugar. Clewiston is like one of the, Clewiston, Florida has lots of sugar, sugar cane fields and it's like coined the sweetest place on earth. So she won this Miss Brown Sugar pageant and this pageant came with a scholarship. So she was able to go to nursing school. She was a very bright, on the right path, straight and narrow type of kid. So it was very concerning that she had not turned up. So police keep an eye out for Erica over the next couple of days. But unfortunately that same week on the 11th, a body is found in a sugarcane field. And the body is actually found by farmers work in the field. The body is found by one farmer in particular who is up high you know in a tractor so he sees it from a distance and of course they're alarmed and call 911 right away and they don't approach like they don't want to disturb anything the body is identified as erica pretty quickly because her family had already reported her missing and she had very distinct tattoos on her leg near her ankle she had like candy canes and peppermints going around and Erica her body it was in rough shape she had suffered a lot she had been run over twice so she had tire tracks over her body in different directions and so so somebody had hit her one time or ran over her once put it in reverse and like did it again it's very sick okay she also had some gunshot wounds but the gunshot wounds, because of the type of rounds that were used, weren't fatal injuries, okay? Her fatal injury would have been from being ran over. Her pelvis was crushed, and so she had a very slow, painful death. They feel like she could have been alive in the cornfields for a couple of days before she succumbed to the type of injuries that she had. And this information is obviously crushing to her family. You know, this is everybody's baby sister. She's the youngest of nine. So obviously detectives can't do much with the missing persons case, but now that this is a homicide investigation, it's all hands on deck. And we really don't think it's going to be a hard case to get to the bottom of. Clewiston is a small town, about 6,000 people. So they're thinking it's going to be easy for them to solve. So obviously the first people they set out to interview were her friends and her family who were the last people to see her. So they start with her sister who was actually there while she was getting ready to head out to the Super Bowl party. She actually said that Erica had got word that the Super Bowl party was happening from her friend Mookie. And Mookie like convinced her to come out to this party and her sister, you know, watched her get ready for this party and all of the things. And then, you know, she just never came back. But she tells them that they need to talk to Mookie. She also told detectives that Erica had been seeing this like mystery man that they didn't know much about. And he, she, and she was with him 
the morning of the Super Bowl, he had dropped her off and his car kind of stood out, A, because he kind of dropped her off down the street, but B, one of Erica's nephews who was also in the home, he saw the car and the car had like a Friday the 13th Jason mask hanging from the rear view mirror and it spooked him. So like this encounter with her being dropped off that morning before the Super Bowl, it stuck out to the family. So they head out to talk to Mookie, the friend she went to the Super Bowl party with and to see if Mookie knew the mystery man that she had been seeing. So Mookie tells detectives that she and Erica had a pretty regular, regular night. You know, they went to the Super Bowl party, they had fun, but things didn't get weird until Mookie went to drop Erica back off at her home. So Mookie says that as Erica was getting out of the car, she got a phone call from a mystery man. She didn't know who it was. But she could hear that it was a man like on the other end of the phone and she said erica on the phone made plans to meet this man where they always do but obviously mookie was only hearing erica's side of the conversation erica said let's meet what we all let's meet what we always do and then they departed okay she doesn't know where erica went or who she was with she says that she thought Erica was talking to a man by the name of Lance. Lance was one of Erica's exes who she had a very like toxic, abusive relationship with. And Erica knew Mookie wouldn't like her talking to Lance. So she thought she was keeping it a secret because it was Lance on the phone. And it wasn't just like simple, like toxic, regular toxic. It was like police being called. Lance was arrested several different occasions because of things he had done to Erica, okay? And he was living in New York because of all the trouble he had gotten himself into for doing the things that he had done to Erica, but was in town for the weekend for the Super Bowl. So before they approach Lynch, they want to double check to see if this was the person on the other end of the phone, her last phone call, but they're not gonna be able to tell that right away because the cell phone records were gonna take a couple of weeks to come back. And as they're waiting for cell phone records to come back, they actually get a lead like kind of unexpectedly so Erica's family had been riding around looking for the car with the Jason mask on the rear view mirror and her sister was riding around and found the vehicle it's an SUV she recognized it and she called it into detectives detectives pull the plates on the car to see who owns it and it's kind of like a ding 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 because this man his name is Lamarcus and Lamarcus works in the sugarcane fields so obviously they want to go out and talk to him ASAP this eye cream is so thick it looks like mayonnaise but anyway so go out and talk to Lamarcus at his home and he does admit to having like a sexual relationship with Erica and he does admit to being the one who dropped her off the morning of the Super Bowl, but he says, you know, they just have like a casual type of relationship, nothing crazy. And he said the Jason mask in his rear view was like not a sign of his character. <laughs> he just likes scary movies. I hate people who ride around with like masks and stuff on their rear view. If I have to do a double take in traffic because you scared the shit out of me, I'm pissed. But anyway, ultimately, Lamarcus is ruled out as a suspect because he works at the sugarcane fields, but not in them. He works in the office. So he was clocked in on camera witnesses the whole time, the night of her disappearance. And during the Super Bowl afterwards, he was actually working a double back-to-back -back shift. So he was there the entire time. And so after they rule out one suspect, they go ahead and decide to talk to Lance. Like I said, Lance is like in town from New York. So they catch up to him where, his, where he's staying. They want to ask him about the night of the Super Bowl, where he's been since then, what he's been up to. And ultimately, they ask him if he's willing to take a polygraph test. And he tells them that he's going to get a lawyer before he says anything to them. And they also get another lead from somebody willing to make a little jailhouse deal. Okay, this man was arrested for armed robbery. As he's being arrested for armed robbery, he's like, well, I got information on a murder. Let's trade information, okay? He tells them that a man by the name of Eric Campbell, who was recently 
arrested, okay, for failing to re-register as a sex offender was involved in Erica's murder. So Eric Campbell was at the Super Bowl party that night with Erica and um, he admits to being there or seeing her but he said he was too drunk to even be involved in something like that. He said he was blackout drunk, passed out and everybody who was there that night knows that. That's what Eric says. So for detectives, this is another lead that fizzles out, burns up, dissipates, okay? But luckily for them, they don't have to keep chasing all these random leads because they finally get her phone records back three weeks after her murder, okay? And they can finally see who this last person that she made this phone call to. But when they check the phone records, it's a freaking like burner prepaid cell phone that you walk into Walmart, you pay to put minutes on, and then you leave, okay? So it's no like, registered number but they do see that shortly after the murder this burner phone somebody whoever was using this prepaid phone got rid of it and switched numbers so whoever had this phone ditched it dumped it directly after the murder the last phone call on erica's phone was from this burner phone and the last phone call this burner phone made was to erica's phone so obviously whoever had this phone is probably involved in what happened to erica but they have no idea who the phone belongs to so while they thought the cell phone records were going to be like a big lead for them they have to switch gears and look elsewhere now there was a lot of speculation about her death erica's passing what happened and so erica had a friend named jasmine and jasmine shortly after the murder started painting remodeling her home painting the walls ripping up carpet and so people in the area start saying you know she's redoing her whole house she must be cleaning up after the crime like whatever brutalization had happened to erica must have happened in jasmine's home that's why jasmine is doing all of this work in her house to cover it up so detectives go out to talk to jasmine but jasmine tells detectives that they are barking up the wrong tree you know nothing like that happened and she gives them full reign to come into her house look around come through without any without any hesitation, without hovering over them. She just lets them, you know, go through the house, look at, turn over whatever they want, and they determine that nothing sinister had happened inside of her home. So now faced with another dead end, what detectives decide to do is comb through the call log of the burner cell phone, okay? So they have to subpoena these records of the burner cell phone they looked through months and months of records to see who this burner cell phone was calling on a regular basis and then from there they looked through all of these phone numbers to see if any of the phone numbers were people they recognized erica's friends her family boyfriends you know if this number was tied to erica in any way and what they realized is that one of the phone numbers was Erica's neighbor directly across the street. So this burner phone had been calling the house directly across the street from Erica's home like every single day. Like this was somebody that the burner phone talked to regularly. So it's probably somebody they know very well. So they go to Erica's neighbor's house to say, hey, here's this phone number that we see has been calling you almost every day. Y'all talk all the time. Whose number is this? So the home is a family home. It's a mother and her kids and detectives read out the number. They're like, hey, whose number is this? The mom doesn't know. But detectives notice that when the kid hears the number, they're kind of looking around like, uh oh, I know who that is, even though they didn't say that they knew. So detectives feel like they're finally on the right track. So detectives can tell that there's something fishy going on with the family, but they luckily don't have to go out and figure it out on their own, okay? Someone comes forward. This man's name is Theopolis Brooks, and he is the son of the woman who owns the house across the street from Erica's family. And he calls into detectives himself to say, hey, my mom let me know that y'all are looking for the person who has my old cell phone number. So this burner phone was his old cell phone number. And this is March 14th, 2011. So a little bit over a month after the murder, they have Theopolis Brooks saying that this is his old number. 
So Theopolis comes in willingly to talk to detectives and give them a statement for the night of the Super Bowl. And when they start pressing him about the night in question, he says that he saw her that night, but you know, nothing happened. He said they had a sexual relationship from time to time, but they had grown up, you know, across the street from each other. So they knew each other, but it was nothing, you know, serious, crazy going on. So detectives can tell through their questioning and through how Theopolis is acting, he's very guilty. He flips over a picture of Erica that is on the interrogation table. So it's face down so he doesn't have to look at it. And they're like, okay, this is our guy. We just got to get him to confess because we don't have no evidence. Eventually, after giving bits and pieces of his night, bits and pieces of what was going on, he, uh, he admits to murdering Erica. And he says he murdered Erica because she was like a root worker, uh, to put it in layman's terms, a witch. And she was like making things and planting them around his house and basically like hexing his family and bringing them misfortune, bad luck. So he needed to kill her to stop her from doing what she was doing. <sighs> and he said their normal place where they met up and had sex was a motel. He said he, they, and he said they went to the motel, they did what they did, and then he shot her from behind without her knowing, but she was still alive. And so he took her out to the sugarcane fields. By the time they made it out to the sugarcane fields, she was still breathing. And so this is why he, ran her over with the car twice. And of course, they don't think this voodoo root working thing is actually the case. They think Theopolis, this was probably some sort of lover's quarrel. Maybe he was jealous. Maybe he seen her get out of the car with the other man the morning before. That's, you know, a more likely happenstance, okay? Because there was no evidence of what he was saying. And Theopolis, after giving a full confession, takes a guilty plea. So luckily the family didn't have to go through a trial or anything like that, but ultimately Erica was killed by somebody who literally grew up across the street from her, somebody that the whole family knew and was familiar with. And for what? Like we really don't know and he will probably never admit to what really happened that night. But this is ultimately just another senseless killing that did not have to happen because of whatever happened that night. I also think a 40 year plea deal is light work for somebody who shot somebody and then ran them over with their car twice. But as always, leave your thoughts, comments, and opinions in the comments down below. I'm sure we can all agree that he did not murder her because she was casting spells on his house, okay? But that is a wrap on today's video. This story about four Los Angeles County Sheriff's employees ending their own lives earlier this week in a 24-hour period is getting a lot of discussion online. Reports say that on Monday morning, the Homicide Bureau responded to a call to the home of Commander Darren Harris, where he was found deceased from a GSW to his head. Later on Monday, they responded to a call to the home of a retired Sergeant Greg Hovland, and they say that he passed away from a self-inflicted GSW to the chest. And just a short time after that call for Greg Hovland, they get another call to the home of another employee, Karina Thompson. She also passed away from a GSW to the chest. Early on Tuesday morning, they responded to a hospital for a fourth employee's death. Now, they have not said what caused this death, but they do say that it was self-inflicted and they also have not released the identity of this individual. They go on to say that all of these cases that occurred within 24 hours of one another 
seem to be unrelated. However, most people on the internet disagree with this. There's a strange missing persons case happening right now out of Oregon, and we should talk about it. This is Gwen Brunel. She went missing during a solo road trip from Boise, Idaho to California. She told family and friends that she was meeting up with a nationally recognized rabbit judge in a small town near Fresno, but she never made it. The timeline of events after she left her home is bizarre, and it's what makes this case so strange. Gwen left her home in Boise on June 26th of this year. The trip seemed really sudden to her family and friends, but she told them that she was planning on meeting up with a rabbit judge in California to show some of her show rabbits. From a very young age, she was an expert on raising and showing purebred rabbits, so much so that she had won awards and was nationally recognized. It was her calling, and she loved her rabbits. So that day, she packed up her 2008 Honda Element with some personal belongings, some clothes for a road trip, and three cages filled with 11 of her show rabbits. Also packed up was about a week's worth of food and water for the rabbits. She promised her dad that she would keep in touch, but no one heard from her again after she stepped foot outside of her house, and her cell phone was soon shut off. Gwen was then spotted at a convenience store about 20 miles from her home. But what's strange is that she was caught on CCTV footage wearing different clothes from when she left her house. She left her home in a blue shirt and Nike shoes, but at the store she was wearing a red shirt and knee-high dress boots. What's also weird is that the store was only 20 miles away, yet it took her three hours to get there, and no one knows what she was doing in the meantime. Gwen was officially last seen in Jordan Valley, Oregon one day later. She had stopped at a Sinclair gas station around noon, got gas, and then went across the street to buy snacks at Mrs. Z's convenience store. There, she told the attendant that she was in a hurry, but she then spent the next hour in the parking lot in her car without moving. This concerned the worker, so they went out to make sure that she was okay, but Gwen stated that she was fine. But after this, she disappeared, and it didn't take long for her parents to report her missing. Four days later, Gwen's car was found abandoned near Sucker Creek Road in Mallard County, just a half mile from the highway. It was reportedly parked at a pullout that was commonly used by visitors. All four windows were partially open, and the keys and the rest of her personal belongings, including her credit cards and driver's license, were still inside. Also inside of the car were all 11 of her rabbits, but sadly, at this point, because of the heat, five of them had perished. Authorities and dozens of volunteers began searching for Gwen in the area near where her car was found, and even a private search of Sucker Creek was conducted, but nothing would be found for two months. On September 10th, Gwen's t-shirt was found tangled up in a barbed wire fence near Dog Creek. Shortly after, Gwen's boots were found roughly 80 yards from where the shirt was found. This was all found less than two miles from where her abandoned car was found months earlier. More than 300 miles have been searched using ATVs, dogs, and even by air, but no other trace of Gwen has ever been found. Police say that there is no sign of an abduction and believe that she may have wandered off into the rangeland. But like I mentioned earlier, Gwen absolutely loved her rabbits. It would be incredibly odd for her to leave them in a hot car to perish without willingly coming back. According to her family, Gwen did take medications for certain mental conditions that could make her moody or inattentive. Her mom reached out to the rabbit judge that Gwen was supposed to meet, and according to them, they never heard from Gwen and had no idea that she was even planning to come. They said that they weren't expecting Gwen at all. This is left her family wondering if she was planning on meeting up with someone else and just didn't tell them. Her mom believes that Gwen is still somewhere out there on the rangeland and wonders if she was possibly going through a mental crisis. Regardless, they just want to bring their daughter home. It's now been five months with no sign of Gwen, and just like with the Chelsea Grimm case, it's really concerning that her car was found abandoned and that she was a woman traveling alone. Gwen is described as being 5'7", roughly 140 pounds, and has brown hair and brown eyes. If you have any information at all, please either contact the Boise Police at 208-377-6790 or the Mallard County Sheriff's Office at 541-473-5125. So this TikToker, you aren't ready for this one. So this is Sabrina, a nice beauty influencer from Chile. She posts beauty tutorials, dance videos, stuff like that. And she's on TikTok for about a year and she builds up kind of a small following. And one day, suddenly, she just stops posting. She disappeared. About three months later, she starts making TikToks again from prison. So why is she in prison? Actually, let me start over. So this is Sabrina, a nice beauty influencer from Chile, also known as Narco Queen. And they call her Narco Queen because she's the leader of a small drug trafficking gang along with her brothers. The gang isn't huge, but they have cartel connections. And like most gangs, they have territorial beef with other rival gangs in the area. And they exchange a lot of pum pum fire. Like... Lots of it. And the neighborhood residents hate it. So much so that they record videos of it. 
but they don't report any of this to the police because Narco Queen and her gang would threaten them. And they're kind of a scary bunch. Now, Chilean police, they recognize this problem. And at some point, they have a website set up where people can report crime anonymously. And that website gets so many anonymous reports that it gets the attention of these guys, the PDI, Counter Narcotics Division. And after a while, PDI has enough evidence. And they gather a bunch of officers and they raid all the properties affiliated with Narco Queen and her gang. In one of these properties, an apartment, Narco Queen is there. And PDI, they've got the place surrounded. And they come busting in, SWAT team style. And Narco Queen's like, oh sh and she tries to escape and she jumps out a window. And here she is making her getaway. And her brothers do the same thing. Now PDI eventually catches up to her and they arrest her and they sentence her to three years in prison. And that was the day she stopped posting her videos and disappeared from TikTok for a while. Oh, but it's not over for Narco Queen. So she's in prison for about three months and she starts posting to TikTok again. Now, I don't know how Chilean prisons work, but I guess she has access to a phone and civilian clothing, but this is her cell and that's her prison bunk bed back there behind her. But here's where it gets interesting. While she's in prison, she meets this woman, Antonella, her cellmate. Coincidentally, Antonella is also the leader of a drug trafficking gang and it also runs in her family. So Antonella and Narco Queen have a lot in common. In fact, they have so much in common, they eventually fall in love. Dem demonstrated by the many photos they take together. Now, after less than a year in prison, Narco Queen is let out early. And for the most part, she goes back to making her regular beauty influencer TikToks. Now, I don't know if she goes back to the trafficking lifestyle, but I, I found no evidence for that. But her girlfriend, Antonella, is still in prison. And Narco Queen misses her a lot. And she posts about it. Now, allegedly, the plan is to wait for Antonella's sentence to end so that the two can be together, as they are still very much in love. But then, one day, Narco Queen had been out for about six months, and she needs to get her nails done, so she goes to drive to the nail salon nearby. And that's when several men in masks rush her car, and she stops in the middle of the road, and she gets out, and she tries to get away. But they pune pune her. Then the men start to leave, but they come back and pune pune her several more times to make sure she doesn't get back up. And no, she doesn't get back up. And it all happened on camera in broad daylight. They then took her car as a getaway vehicle. And they drove her car quite a distance, and then they abandoned it and set it ablaze. Now, police believe the motive for this involved settling scores, potentially related to all the beef with rival gangs that led to these videos. And yeah, by the way, Narco Queen's TikTok is still up. That's how the bite mark happened. But that Lisa left Jennifer alive, and that Jim must have returned to the apartment. All right, guys, so a little background on today's case it is august of 2016 chloe randolph after graduating high school a year and a half early after working hard and being very diligent enrolls in henderson community college in henderson kentucky where she was born and raised, okay? Chloe enrolled in Henderson Community College because she was trying to jumpstart her nursing career. She wanted to become a hospice nurse. So she was very diligent in her studies. But Chloe, while in school, starts working with older, mentally disabled people in their homes and she just loved it she loved helping people in need and she felt like helping people who couldn't help themselves was like her calling so chloe's in school and she's working keeping her head down and you know keeping her grades up but in the spring of 2017 she meets a guy gabriel abdukadir was this boy's name and he is from somalia And Gabriel, who was 19, had not been in the States for very long. Just for about a few months, he was sent over to the United States to live with his sister. He and two of his other siblings, because his parents wanted them to experience, you know, better things in the United States. That kind of vibe. Ugh. So Gabriel hadn't been in America for long. Gabriel was in school for phlebotomy. They had similar prerequisites, you know, that kind of thing. So they crossed paths, they met, and they were inseparable. Up 
and their relationship kind of moves pretty fast. Um, just a few weeks into dating, Chloe brings Gabriel home to meet her father and her stepmother who raised her. So they were a very close knit family, all right? Chloe's father had two children, Chloe and her brother Jason, with their mother but shortly after the birth of her brother they were divorced and chloe and her brother ended up living with their father okay so she and her dad grew up super close while he was working obviously he needed help with his two kids and then soon after that he met chloe's stepmom okay who stepped in to raise them as her own chloe and her brother jason Chloe's stepmom was like the perfect mom. They loved each other. She stepped into that motherly role. She stepped into that motherly role for Chloe, you know, doing proms, homecomings, getting her ready, you know, that kind of thing. They were super, super close even for a blended family. So like I said, in spring of 2017, Chloe and Gabriel, they meet, she's bringing them home. And then by July, 2017, the two of them moved in together. And while fast, her family, her parents were supportive. Gabriel seemed to be the perfect gentleman. And he was very nice and mannerly to Chloe. And then by August of 2017, Chloe and Gabriel were married, okay? They had just kind of picked up one day and decided to go to the courthouse and get married and that's what they did. They went with some of their friends as witnesses and got married. She let her dad know she was married by sending him a picture of the marriage license because it was kind of just like a spur of the moment type of thing. And while her family was of course like shocked, her father and her stepmom had kind of gotten married in a similar way they decided to get married they had decided they wanted to be married that they couldn't wait anymore so they too just ran to the courthouse on their literal lunch breaks from work and got married and went back to work like it was nothing so her family just trusted that chloe was happy and you know went along with it and then in september 2017 Chloe finds out that she is pregnant. It seems like as soon as two people move in together, they get pregnant. Or at least that's like a thing we say in my family. Do y'all feel that way? Chloe is a little apprehensive to tell her family. She's not sure how they will react, but I mean, Chloe is an adult. She's got her own place. She's living with her husband. So it's easy for her family, you know, to be excited. They don't judge or anything like that. They're extremely supportive. Which Chloe will soon need the extra support from her family. Gabriel started, you know, to switch up. He wasn't super involved in her pregnancy. Her stepmother went with her to most of her OB appointments even though they were living in the same house he just seemed uninterested in welcoming the baby and i hate when men act like they don't know like sex means baby like you know what i'm saying like every time you lay down you risk it like i don't know why men don't get that like you know what i'm saying like they, they be shocked that somebody is pregnant how how you were you were doing the deed but anyway but Chloe, you know, even though she's living in the house with her husband, seems to be, you know, welcoming her baby on her own, outside from the support from her family. And Gabriel is taking the back seat, not even a back seat, like the way back, the back of the bus. And her family could tell that she was hurting, that she didn't really like the way things were going. She didn't like that Gabriel was absent um, when it came to doing things for the baby. But she was seemingly trying to like save face and like make excuses for them, you know, trying to paint the picture of a happy home, 
you know, he was just tired, he was too this, he was too that to go to the appointments, things of that nature, you know. She didn't really shit on Gabriel for not coming and being involved the way he should have been. So her stepmom and her dad are taking turns, taking Chloe to all of her baby appointments, checkups, things of that nature. Even though she has a husband at home. This brings us to June 13th, 2018. Chloe goes in for a scheduled C-section and she's ultimately there with just her parents and her stepmother plans to go back into like labor, not even labor and delivery. What do you call it when you have a C-section? Is it just like the operating room? I never had a C-section. I don't know how those work. I guess it would into the operating room. So, so yeah, she originally plans to go in with her stepmother there beside her not her husband it said that at the last minute gabriel steps up and he decides that he actually does want to be there when the baby's born when the baby pops out so at the last minute he comes in and steps into that role and chloe's parents oblige you know just to keep the peace out of just to keep the peace just to keep things copacetic and to focus on the baby you know so gabriel while present for the birth is still not intending on having this baby around him every day and as they're preparing to leave the hospital he tells chloe and her family that the baby can't come home to their house that chloe and the baby need to go home to her father and stepmom's house because he doesn't want a crying baby in the home with him keeping him awake okay what and that just wasn't enough for him just a week after the baby was born he decides to move out of the home that he shares with chloe and the baby and move in with his sister for some peace and quiet and chloe is now a married single mother before she's even old enough to drink and I used to always think about like being 21 <laughs> when I had my first baby and that's how I kept myself from not having any more babies. I was like, I refuse to be a mom of two kids before I'm old enough to drink, okay? But their baby is absolutely beautiful. I don't like to post people's kids. I'm not gonna do that. But um, there's plenty of pictures of this little boy. If you would like to go see him, he's very cute. But Chloe is rocking it, doing her thing, taking care of her baby, and everything is copacetic um, until she is disturbed. In October of 2018, when Gabriel files for divorce, and shortly after filing for divorce, he files for full custody of their son and $500 a week in child support from Chloe. So falling off the face of the earth and not even wanting the baby to come home from the hospital with him. Six months into the baby's life, he's asking for full custody and child support at that. But you know they say like African men are either like the best men you'll ever meet or the absolute worst. So that is in October, November 2018, all right? Things kind of stall out during the holidays. Y'all know the court system is slow. But by March of 2019, Chloe's got her own lawyer and they're preparing to go to court. But before their court date comes up, Gabriel shows up at Chloe's home. He's asking him to take the baby with him because he has family coming in town and he wants his family to meet his son. And she did not want to say yes at all whatsoever. But to keep the peace, she didn't want to cause like a yelling match or anything like that. She decides to let the baby go with Gabriel. And I think we've talked about this before, but like when both parents are on the birth certificate, there's really nothing you can do. It's not kidnapping, it's nothing like that. So if Gabriel decides to take the baby and not bring him back, which is ultimately what he does, there's really nothing Chloe can do. But, but we've talked about it before because I know a girl who did not see her child for like, I wanna say two years. That's how long it took the court system to help her 
settle a custody agreement with her partner because they were both on the birth certificate and her partner decided to come scoop the baby up and literally not bring their child back for years. She had not seen her child in years. So yeah, definitely keep that in mind. If he is on the birth certificate and you don't trust him to bring your baby back. And soon after leaving with their son, Gabriel starts taunting and threatening Chloe saying, you know, if she doesn't pay child support, she will never see the baby again. And he's gonna leave the country with the baby. Which is some crazy ass shit. You didn't even want the baby to begin with. Now you're about to leave the country. Men are so irrational. I just can't deal. Legally, I don't think he would have been able to get on a plane with the baby without the baby having a passport. And I doubt since he was absent that the baby had a passport. So he probably wouldn't have been able to leave the country with the baby. I don't know. I don't think that works like that. But either way, it's very scary, very threatening. Um, Chloe decides to call her parents obviously so chloe's father and her younger brother that we mentioned in the beginning of the video now obviously much older they go over to where gabriel had been living and basically wait for him to pull up to see if they can you know get the baby from him so they wait outside of gabriel's apartment for him to pull up because they realize that he is at home. When he does pull up, there is somewhat of a confrontation, okay? So Gabriel pulls up, he has someone else in the car with him, a friend of his, and Chloe's father is asking for his grandson. But unfortunately, in the car with him, there's no baby. They don't know where the baby's at. Chloe's father approaches the car and kind of jams Gabriel up in the car because he thinks Gabriel has a gun on his side so they are basically just arguing take me to the baby da 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 you know y'all know type shit in the parking lot of this apartment complex so chloe's father's got gabriel like jammed up in the car trying to stop him from brandishing his weapon and quite frankly ready to die about his child as most fathers would be i can't say that my dad would have done anything differently okay but because it is a big, huge hubbub and commotion, um, the cops are called by neighbors in the apartment complex. So they're trying to come to some sort of resolution in this parking lot. Um, Chloe's father is trying to get himself in the car with Gabriel and have Jason, her brother, drive with Gabriel's friend that's in the car with him like one-on-one -on -one, and you take me to the baby because I don't trust your ass like we're not we're not I'm not following you you're not about to lose me none of that we're gonna go one-on-one -on -one. each car will get the baby and go about our business but um before they can come to any kind of conclusion they Chloe's father decides to leave the scene before police arrive but he does later turn himself in though gabriel decides not to press charges probably because he shouldn't have even had the gun to begin with you know so this just ends up being a big hubbub with no real resolution the day after this incident with chloe's father and gabriel chloe calls her father to say that gabriel told her you know she can have the baby back but if she wants to have the baby back, she needs to come get him right away. Chloe's father tells her to just wait. He was almost finished up with work and he would accompany her, but Chloe does not want to wait. And she says that Gabriel doesn't feel comfortable having him around after what happened the day before, that she was just gonna go quickly to go get the baby and come right back and that she would call him after the fact but unfortunately this phone call would be the last phone call chloe and her father would have this brings us to march 23rd 2019 after not hearing from chloe in a while her family calls in a welfare check and um, they know that chloe's not at her home so they call in a welfare check to gabriel's apartment and they cannot originally make entry into the home. There's no answer at the door, but there's also no probable cause that is until 
detectives in Kentucky get a call from Arizona. Did I say Arizona? I meant to say Arkansas. We're in Arkansas. Gabriel had driven to Arkansas with the, with the baby and called 911 from like the Welcome Center in Arkansas. And he was with the same friend he was with that was in the car with him during the altercation with Chloe's father, okay? So not only did Gabriel call 911 from the Welcome Center, but he was also called in by like just bystanders. People called into 911 saying that there was a man near the Welcome Center just like walking in the middle of the road, seemingly having some sort of like mental disturbance, okay? Police cars, detectives head out to him to see what the heck is going on. And he tells them that his spouse, his wife, had killed herself back in Kentucky. And detectives are like right off the bat, well, why the hell are you all the way in Arkansas? What's going on? So they're not even sure if there's any real danger, if there's anyone hurting or injured. They just think because of his state of mind that Gabriel's having some sort of mental breakdown so they bring him the baby and his friend Isaac into the local police station in Arkansas as well as calling in to Kentucky to let them know what's going on so after they get this info from Gabriel of his wife possibly being deceased in the home a detective on top on top of the welfare check a detective heads over to the home to enter the home first in case this is a crime scene and it is unfortunately when they enter the home there's blood everywhere blood spatter bloody handprints this was obviously the scene of some sort of stabbing from all of the blood spatter everywhere the crime scene photos are very graphic i'm not going to include them in this video because that it's nobody needs to nobody needs to see that um but down the hallway in like a coat closet there's blood kind of pooling from underneath the door um they opened the door to the coat closet and chloe's body was in the closet and she'd been stabbed several times and her well yeah. so in kentucky they're like this is obviously a murder like obviously a brutal attack but in arkansas Gabriel is telling detectives that she killed herself. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. And during this time, the baby is in the interrogation room with Gabriel. Once the different police departments exchange information, um, child services comes in and scoops the baby up, obviously, okay? and he is taken in a police car back to Kentucky. And then for Chloe's family, this is kind of like a double whammy. Not only have they lost Chloe, their daughter, their sister, but they don't have the baby. Gabriel, the baby's last living legal guardian, refuses from <laughs> custody to, um, release the baby to Chloe's parents. So Chloe's parents have to go through the court system and file the baby out of the damn court system. Out of the court system. Out of the damn court system. Out of child services care. So once back with Henderson police, um, Gabriel is telling detectives that Chloe hit herself in the head with a hammer and then her own throat. Then, when he realizes this story isn't really working for detectives, he decides to blame the whole thing on his friend Isaac. He said, Isaac did it all. Isaac hit her with a hammer. Isaac hit her throat. Then, he realizes that that story also is not working for detectives. So, he then says that he did all this, beating her in the head with a hammer in self-defense. Sure, just exhaust all your options. Think about it. I mean... So he eventually 
confesses to the murder. Um, he says after that he showered, cleaned up, packed the baby in the car with Isaac and they kind of just rolled around until they were in Arkansas. And that's when he decided to finally call 911 and he came up with the suicide story. But the crazy thing is after doing all this in the state of Kentucky, Gabriel still had the legal right to Chloe's remains because that was his wife. And so he refused to sign over these rights, okay, to her family so they can go ahead and give her a proper burial. Luckily, you cannot make funeral arrangements or do anything like that from a jail cell. So the time ran out and then Chloe's family was able to have her body, do a proper burial, all of the things. But Kentucky, what kind of law is that? And... If that wasn't crazy enough, Gabriel pleads and only gets 20 years for a second degree. Hopefully, when he is ready for parole in 2040. Ahmed Abi Kadir has now been charged with the murder of his estranged wife, Chloe Abdi Kadir. Henderson police transported Mohammed to the Henderson County Jail around 2.30 this afternoon after police in Arkansas arrested him there earlier this week. Police say Mohammed Ali Kadir admitted to hitting Chloe with a hammer several times and then a throat. Police say he then put her body in a closet, took a shower, and left. There were multiple calls, previous calls in reference to a uh, possible domestic or a verbal argument of some sort between the two um, prior to this incident. Couple had a nine month old son. Police say the child was found with Mohammed in Ar Arkansas and is safe tonight. His parole comes with a side of deportation. Send him back to where the fuck he came from. Cause we got enough Looney Tunes in the States already, but Chloe's family, they get her body back. They're able to have a proper burial. Chloe's father and stepmother have full custody of her baby. And they also start the Chloe Randolph organization to bring awareness to domestic violence and to help women in those situations. Chloe's cases is one of those cases that happened fairly recently. So there's lots of news footage and things like that on YouTube. If you want to check that out, I'm sure I'll include some in the video as well. And what kind of sticks out to me in this case is like, I feel like we warn our daughters about like certain things, but we don't really warn them about the men who want to rush into relationships, rush into moving in, rush into marriage. Like sometimes it's not always what it seems, especially men from other countries trying to rush you down the altar so they can secure their spot in the States. I feel like that happens more than we realize and women in these situations feel stuck. I don't know, but that is a wrap on today's case. Before we close out, y'all have been tagging me in so many of like the Susie pesto stitches, the true crime ones on TikTok. So I'm gonna put a couple of the Susie pesto stitches y'all have been tagging me in in the end of this video. Sure about pesto. Wow, Susie, that is crazy. Almost as crazy as this one time back in 2019 when I was made aware of this fake Facebook profile that was using my pictures and my name, but instead of it being Sophie Phelps Sweeney, it was Sophie Ray Sweeney. And this Sophie Ray Sweeney account was in a relationship with this guy named Jacob McGuire who had a mohawk. And there was photoshopped pictures of me with this Jacob McGuire guy and also like sonograms as if I was pregnant. And I was like, hmm, that's kind of weird. But like, there's people that make fake profiles of me all the time. You know, I'm just gonna report it and block it and move on with my life. So I move on with my life don't think much of it and then a couple months later it's the beginning of 2020 and all of a sudden you are bombarded with hundreds of messages on Facebook and Instagram of people being like the skin suit video the FBI the CIA the skin suit and you're like skin suit what the fuck are y'all talking about? So you finally find the video on Facebook and it is a video of this Jacob McGuire guy with his mohawk and this like morbidly obese woman. And the girl is claiming that she is the real Sophie, but that the real Sophie has actually been put inside of her, that the FBI has her inside of a skin suit. And that the Sophie that everybody sees on social media, on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok is actually an FBI clone of her. And that she's the real Sophie. And the Sophie that's out there on social media is living at her dad's house and riding her horses 
houses and shooting her guns and playing with her dogs and all this other very insane stuff. And it's like a 10 minute long video of Jacob McGuire and this girl claiming that the real Sophie is in the skin suit inside of her body and that she's four months pregnant and it's so unhealthy and it's not good for her and that the FBI needs to come and take her out of this skin suit. And you're like, what the fuck? This is fucking weird. And all of the comments are people tagging the FBI in the skin suit and the video is going viral and you're like, this is so fucking weird. And then you look the next day and the video is gone, which luckily you screen recorded part of it so you still have part of it. You're like, man, that was really weird. And then you just move on with your life because what are you going to do about it? So then a couple months goes by and it's like peak COVID season and you have a friend come and pick you up and take you to the tanning bed because your truck is in the shop. And when you get to the tanning bed, you get a notification on your ring doorbell that somebody is at your front door and you look and you see a guy facing the other way and you're like, oh, it's probably the mailman who needs like a signature or something. So you get on there and you're like, hi, can I help you? And the guy turns around and oh, he has a mohawk and it's Jacob McGuire standing at your front door and you're like oh my god this is not good like and you tell your friend like call the police and tell them to get to my house right now this is not good and you answer and you're like uh can I help you and he's like yeah I'm looking for Randall Sweeney and Sophie Sweeney my name is Jacob McGuire and you're like um what and he's like I need Sophie Sweeney I need Sophie Sweeney and you're like um she doesn't live here like you have the wrong address so then he leaves and you're like oh my gosh this is so weird so the police meet you at your house and then you explain to them the whole situation and you show them the video on Facebook that you screen recorded and you see everything else and if y'all want to see that video let me know because I still have it and they're like okay you know we're gonna make a report of this but we can't actually like do anything about it because he didn't actually like violate any laws and you're like man that sucks but at least there's like a paper trail that this happened because this is fucking insane and now he has your address and he knows where you live even though you told him that you didn't live there so then you go back inside of your house after the police leave and you check your email and you have an email from a U.S. Marshal and it's like hi Sophie this is U.S. Marshal so and so um we had a gentleman named Jacob McGuire show up at our office today claiming that you were his wife and that you had been kidnapped um you know he seemed like he was in a lot of trouble and basically was like really really messed up do you know this person are you okay can you just respond to me to let me know if this person is you know basically wrong or what's going on because i am worried about you so you think oh my gosh this is jacob mcguire pretending to be a u.s marshal and then you look it up and you look the guy's name up and it turns out he is actually a u.s marshal so you're you're like, okay. So then you call them and the U.S. Marshal's office in Little Rock, Arkansas, because you live in Memphis at the time. And you're like, hi, I'm looking for, you know, U.S. Marshal so-and-so. And they're like, oh, he's not here. And you're like, well, my name is Sophie Sweeney. And I just had this guy show up at my house um, claiming that the FBI kidnapped me looking for me. And I got an email from this U.S. Marshal that he had been there first. So I'm trying to get in touch with him. And they're like, oh my gosh, yes, we will get him in touch with you. So you get off the phone and he immediately calls you from his cell phone. And he explains that earlier in the day, the guy and the girl from the video drove all the way from Alabama to to Little Rock, Arkansas, and went into the U.S. Marshal's office and was like, hey, my wife has been kidnapped by the FBI and the CIA. I need help. And they're like, okay, like, come sit down with us. Let's figure this out. And they start talking and asking him, like, hey, when is her birthday? Like, where was she born? How long have y'all been married? And he can't answer any of the questions. They're like, they're like, hmm, this is weird. So then they go in the back to look up information on him. And when they come back out, he and the girl have left and apparently driven to my house in Memphis. And he's like, you know, I just need you to know this is actually a dangerous situation. This guy, Jacob McGuire, has 27 counts of false imprisonment against him on top of having kidnapping charges and um, domestic violence and assault charges against him. And you're like, oh my gosh, what in the world? What happened? He's like, apparently he's a meth head and he thought that his last girlfriend was also a skin suit from the FBI. So he kidnapped her and held her hostage in his house and then cut her open to prove that she was a skin suit, even though obviously she wasn't. And he got released. And you're like, what? why would this person be released? Like, what in the world? This is so scary. So they're able to put an APB out for him and find him and he gets pulled over when him and that girl are on the way back to Alabama and they get arrested and while you're in the process of getting an order of protection against him and and basically charging him with all this stuff you get a text message on April 1st that he's been released from jail and you're like ha April Fool's like he's been released and then it's like wait this is not an April Fool's who's he's literally been released and this guy is just running free and is a meth head who thinks that the FBI has kidnapped me and now he knows where I live and he's going to come and find me and kidnap me and cut me open but you don't hear anything about it for months and you're like okay maybe everything is cool and then it's been three years and then about five days ago I get a text message from somebody that's like hey Jacob McGuire is at it again and it's a screenshot of Jacob McGuire's Facebook and it's all of these posts about Sophie I need you I need to find you but instead this time instead of me being the skin suit and his girlfriend that's been locked up I am his daughter that the FBI has kidnapped and he's looking for me again and you're like wow Jacob McGuire is at it again but pesto that's crazy 
and that one is this is crazy to me because i feel like being stalked by someone who knows you and like has a real relationship with you is one thing but being stalked by somebody who has no clue who you are has never met you in person has just formed this weird thing in their head this psychotic thing in their head this meth fueled psych psychosis i don't know that is terrifying call me crazy if you want but i've never like store bought pesto hey. Oh, you're crazy. Obviously, I don't think I can top that, but I do have an interesting story for you. So I grew up in a neighborhood in San Antonio where there were a ton of kids. And specifically on my street, there were kids my age across the street, next door to me on either side and diagonally. My best girlfriend was the girl that lived diagonally to us, Jackie. But my best guy friend as a kid was the person who lived directly across the street from us, Colin. And I went through my old photo album um, to find a picture. And so this is me and Colin. This is also my little brother, Grant. And Colin had a little sister named Megan, who was also Grant's age. So it was perfect. Until Colin and Megan had to move to Florida for, I guess, their dad's job. I don't really remember. But I remember being so heartbroken. It's like, that was my best friend, you know? But my parents were really sweet, and every single year we would go on spring break to Florida to hang out with Colin and Megan. And my parents kind of went through this financial thing, and we could no longer afford to go to Florida for spring break to go visit them. So me and Colin just kind of fell out of touch. My little brother Grant and his little sister Megan were too young to really stay in touch, and so I just didn't hear from them again for a very long time. 2016. I was just like going through literally this old photo album, saw this picture of me and Colin, and was like, oh my god, I wonder what he's up to. So I get on Facebook and I type in Colin Campbell, and a bunch of Colin Campbells come up, but I can't find him. So then I go to Instagram and I type in Colin Campbell, and again, I can't find him, so I'm like, okay, well, let me try Megan. Type in Megan Campbell, find her, and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's so beautiful. I'm like scrolling through her photos and I find a, a family photo. I click on that. I find Colin and I'm like, Colin's kind of cute. So I DM him and I'm like, oh my gosh. Hey Colin, how are you? I just found this photo of us. I, I hope you're doing well. Like let's do a call sometime. Like let's catch up. After a couple of days passed, um, I didn't hear anything. I like went back on, I think it was Megan's profile first. And um, yeah, I just had a weird feeling about it. And so I scrolled through her photos and I realized she had stopped posting in like 2014. And at this time, I think I said it's 2016 or 18. I'm not really sure. It's an even number. But then I start going through the comments and people are commenting like broken hearts and like the dove emojis and like thought of you today. And I'm like, oh no. So I go to Colin's Instagram and it's the same thing. And like, People on Collins and Instagram are like, that was so unfair, rest in peace. And I'm like, what happened? So I Google Colin Megan Campbell, Florida. And Susie, this is where it gets crazy, but also like super sad. And I read about how their dad Darren Campbell, this guy right here, God. Megan and Colin and his wife, their mom, doused the house in gasoline, lit the house on fire, and then himself, and was caught on CCTV the day before buying a ton of fireworks. And to this day, I look it up every single year to see if like someone has figured out why he did that. And nobody really has an answer. Obviously, um, when I found that out, I wept. Um, I also went back to counseling and like processed that because it was just like, it's quite a lot for me. Um but super, super sad um, and very dark. But you can also read about it and like Google it. It's super sad. Also, if you're watching this and you're not Susie and you have your own true crime podcast or you investigate this kind of stuff, um, 
help us find answers for this because what the heck. Googling and finding out that my childhood best friend not only died but was tragically murdered by his father would have sent me spiraling. That would have been my 13th reason. But child, that is a wrap on today's true crime and make a video. If this was your first time here, make sure you subscribe before you leave and I will see y'all next time. Bye guys. Mark happened, but that Lisa left Jennifer alive and that Jim must have returned to the apartment after. Other. So it's been a minute since I filmed, but this case is like the perfect case to hop back in the saddle. It's a wild one. I feel like I always say that, but they've been wild lately, I don't know. For today's case, guys, we are in Gary, Indiana. Glen Park to be exact. The events of today's case take place February 27th, 1992, okay? And we are at the home of Bernard Jimenez. And shortly after nine on the night in question, Bernie, his fiance Kimberly, and their three kids were making their way back home after a day of shopping, okay? As they're making their way inside, putting the key in the door, grabbing the kids up, you know, getting shopping bags into the home, they are approached by a gunman looking to rob them. And immediately, it's chaos. Bernie rushes his kids and his fiance inside while he struggles with the man with the gun, okay? Kimberly went inside to grab the gun that they owned, but before she could get back outside, she heard gunshots. When she makes it back outside, she finds Bernie collapsed on his neighbor's front porch, and this neighbor had also called 911, so authorities and ambulance, they make it to the scene fairly quickly. And Bernie is taken to the hospital. Kimberly stays behind to talk to detectives and to stay with their children. Kimberly tells detectives that she and her family was attacked by a black man wearing a jacket and a bandana around his neck. She said her attacker was also wearing a black Kango hat. She said that he was of average build, you know, not too big, not too small but he had like pitted acne scarring. Y'all know like the like pitted acne scarring? He had that and that stuck out to her. But aside from that, she had no idea who her attacker was. And he seemed to be in like his early 20s. Multiple neighbors corroborate her story of a black male at the scene. Multiple neighbors saw this black man running down the street. But that's pretty much all they have is that he was black with that particular pitted acne scarring, okay? But there's not much by way of forensic evidence at the scene. There's no DNA, <clears throat> no fingerprints, no blood from their assailant, which is frustrating to police because eventually, after about 30 minutes at the hospital, Bernie succumbs to his injuries, and this is now a murder investigation. They take Bernie's clothes from his person, and send it to forensics for testing. They do find a spent shell casing in his jacket pocket. How did it get in there? It's a great question. But this is the only one that they have, so that's great. And what detectives at the scene quickly realize is that Bernie Bernard Jimenez, what happened to him was one of a string of armed robberies that happened in the area that same night at around the same time. So the first robbery was at about 8.20 p.m. A woman in North Glen Park is getting out of her car and she is robbed at gunpoint, but she is fine, okay? The next victim is at about 8.30 p.m., so just 10 minutes shy of what happened to the first woman and just around the block, there's another robbery. This is another woman who was out that night and she was robbed at gunpoint. Their third victim was robbed just 15 minutes later at 8.45 and this woman's name is Rhonda Williams. After Miss Rhonda is robbed, 
that's when this assailant attacked Bernard, okay? And then after Bernard, there is a fifth and final robbery at about 920. And this all happened in about a three to four block span, so super close together. The fifth and final victim was an off-duty officer, a female off-duty officer and her daughter. That's important, we'll come back to that later, okay? But Bernard Jimenez was the only one who was shot at all, shot at at all, and the only one who passed away. They're thinking things escalated with Bernard because Bernard was the only male that he attacked and Bernard shouted to Kimberly to go get their gun. So probably their assailant got nervous and just shot Bernard and got out of there and then hit the fifth and final victim and then fled the area. So Miss Rhonda was the only other person outside of what happened to Bernard to spend like a considerable amount of time with the assailant. She said she heard a knock at her door and when she opened the door, this man forced his way in and she described him the same as Kimberly did with the pitted acne scarring, the bandana around his neck and the Kango hat. I'll put a picture on the screen if you don't like know what Kango hats are. Miss Rhonda also described him as being like average medium build. And luckily with Miss Rhonda, the only thing that this man did to her was rob her. Um, she thought it was gonna be very bad as he did force her onto the bed and cover her face with a pillow, but he did so just, I guess, so he she wouldn't be watching him as he ransacked the house. But she was not assaulted or anything like that. She said he left and told her to wait a few minutes before she called 911. So detectives are thinking this is, you know, all the same guy. So detectives don't really have any leads, so they start with their victims to try to get an ID on their assailant. So they bring their victims into the Gary Police Department to have them comb through mugshots. The first person to look through these mugshot books is Kimberly. Bernard's fiance and she comes through the books until she comes across someone who she identifies as the perpetrator okay this man's name is William Timothy Donald Rhonda Williams is next and she also identifies William Timothy Donald as the person who attacked her now, after these two women identify him, detectives working on the case take William's photo out of the big book of mugshots and put it in just a photo lineup of six other people and show it to the other victims of the other robberies. But none of the other victims in the other robberies can identify William T. Donald as the person who attacked them mainly because Willie did not have the pitted acne scarring that they all said their attacker had and detectives worked on the case decide to go ahead and arrest full-blown arrest William T Donald because he currently had a bench warrant out for his arrest because of like a traffic violation type thing and his mugshot was in the mugshot book because a few years prior he was arrested because the cops thought he was driving around, well, not even driving, he was riding around in a stolen car. His, a friend of his was riding around in his uncle's car and his uncle <laughs> lost the keys to his car. So like the car was like, what do they call it? When you like, you know, when you like take the thing off and like manually start the car without the key, whatever that's called. They were out at a function on Marquette Beach and I guess just a passing officer noticed the state of the car how I don't know but he noticed that the you know the ignition had been rigged I guess you could say and so he arrested 
William and his friend who was driving the car. Um, it was just a total misunderstanding. The uncle whose the car was came down to the police station with his title and everything like this is my car. I gave them permission to drive it around. The ignition is rigged because I couldn't find the key. And so, you know, charges were never pressed or anything like that. But because of this incident, they were arrested. Mug shots were taken and their fingerprints were taken as well. So that was just like a little misunderstanding, but because like I said, he had the bench warrant out for his arrest for the traffic violation. They go ahead and arrest him. And if that sounds crazy, if that sounds like some bullshit, then just wait. But anyway, so on March 3rd, a fleet of officers go out to arrest William T. Donald on the traffic violation, but really for the murders and this string of rob robberies. So when this fleet of police officers arrives on the scene at his home, Willie was currently living with his sister, her sister's hus his sister's husband and their kids, okay? So Willie opens the door willingly. Um, he assumes that they're there for like, somebody else like he doesn't even think it's anything about him okay so they arrest him and take him down to the station to put him in like a physical lineup you know so Rhonda and Kimberly can identify him in person and again Kimberly and Rhonda identify William T Donald as the person who attacked them but the last victim, the cop and her daughter, they're like, no, like this is not the guy. Like he doesn't have the acne scarring. It's not, that's not him. But after being identified by the two women, he is arrested, booked, and spends the night in jail. His first of many, many, many nights in jail. So after arresting him and after he is identified by the two women, they do an search warrant on his home, his sister's home. It's said that detectives completely ransacked the home, but they find nothing to link him to the crime. They don't find the bandana, they don't find the leather jacket, they don't find the Kango hat, and they don't find a gun. They find nothing linking William T. Donald to the robberies. And then his sister's home was ransacked in this search warrant and they had not even yet been able to talk to Timothy. He had not been given his phone call or anything like that. So when their house was ransacked and searched by the police, they had no idea what was going on. And most importantly, they didn't find any of the effects that had been stolen from all of these victims. No cash, no jewelry, no nothing. Literally just a bust like this search warrant yielded zero and even still they charged Timmy with everything the robberies the murder on robbery everything 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 simply based on these two women identifying him out of a lineup so this man with no prior arrest out, outside of the little mishap um, with the car and then his traffic violation was failing to make a complete stop at a stop sign, okay? So that's not even a big deal. Out of nowhere is charged with a crazy list of things simply because he was identified in a lineup. And in my opinion, this case didn't even have enough to be taken to trial. You know what I'm saying? But it does and it gets even more fucked up, okay? So just, just hold on. And his mugshot and like fingerprints, apparently if you're wrongfully arrested, it is your job to have those like things expunged and taken out of the system. So that's why even though he wasn't even convicted of anything, his mugshot and fingerprints remained in the system. But it does. And William Timothy Donald is going to trial. Now that y'all have been introduced to William Timothy Donald, we're gonna call him Timmy. That's what he goes by, he goes by Timmy. So Timmy and his family prepare for trial. They get Timmy a lawyer. 
and it's all hands on deck for Timmy to try to prove his innocence. Now, Timmy is living with his sister at the time of the robberies. He is the youngest of four and he has all older sisters, okay? They grew up with a mom who worked very hard to not let them feel their circumstances. Like they didn't grow up with a lot of money. They grew up poor, but they didn't feel that way. Their mama worked very hard. So oftentimes things inside of the household fell on Timmy's older sister, the one that he was living with at the time. So she was very protective of Timmy, all right? She gets him a lawyer and they go over the timeline. Fortunately for Timmy, on the night of the murders, okay, he and his sister and his sister's husband, they were out car shopping. Now, they weren't car shopping for Timothy. They were just car shopping in general, but Timmy wanted to but Timmy wanted to tag along. It was a Thursday. The murders happened on the Thursday, and Timmy said he remembered this day very clearly because it was like his payday, so he got paid. So he got off work, he got paid, he had a little money in his pocket, and then he and his sister and his brother-in-law went to go look at cars. But unfortunately, during this time, in 92, car dealerships didn't have like CCTV or anything like that. And the car salesmen were not willing to testify 100% to Timmy being there, like they remembered his sister, okay? And her husband, because they were the ones actively searching and looking to buy a car, Timmy was kind of just there in the background, so to speak. So they could not say for 100% that it was Timmy with them. So while that would have been great for Timmy, the car salesman just could not say for 100% fact that it was him. But even though the car salesman themselves, you know, they cannot alibi Timmy, his sister and brother-in-law do. You know, they know for a fact that Timmy was not involved because they were car shopping all afternoon. Timmy was with them the entire time and they didn't get back home until after all the robberies had already happened at about 10 p.m., okay? So Timmy's family knows for a fact without a shadow of a doubt that he was with them and there was no way possible he could have been robbing people at the same damn time. So just three months later, June 1992, the case goes to trial super quickly and Timmy's family is very uneasy, okay? They know what they know, but they're not sure of how this trial is going to play out. It's basically, you know, their word versus the victim's word. This trial has zero physical evidence, you know, basically the whole gist of the trial is the prosecution having their witnesses come up, Kimberly and Rhonda, and point to Timmy in the courtroom saying that's who did it, and vice versa, the defense, they have Timmy's sister and brother-in-law say, you know, the opposite, he was with us, and unfortunately for Tim Timmy, Kimberly is a very emotional witness. She gets on the stand and she cries about the loss of her fiance. She cries about her kids not having a father. They had a really small baby at the time. And that was really all the jury, you know, needed. Her identifying Timmy as the assailant and unfortunately, Timmy is found guilty. After just four hours of deliberation so not long at all and Timmy at just 23 years old is sentenced to 60 years in pr prison solely based off eyewitness accounts and this is the true injustice of this case this is what we're about to get into Timothy's time in jail and what happened thereafter because not only was Timothy wrongfully convicted but Mr. Bernard's killer is still out on the loose so that was pretty much a little bit of backstory. And now we're going to get into the real true crime. So Timothy's family is obviously heartbroken. And I really can't even imagine how this must have felt for his sister who was physically with him during the time that all of this stuff happened. And, you know, knows for a fact that he couldn't have done it because he was with her. 
I can't really imagine how that must have felt, especially as an older sister who essentially took, you know, a big part in raising Timothy. She probably felt horrible. And just a year, just a year into his conviction, February of 1992 is when like rumors of his case being mishandled and things of that nature started swirling around, okay? Just one year. So a junior detective who was working on the case comes up on some information, okay? So he finds out, and he knew this, during the time of the trial, but his complaint, his concern was not escalated. Okay, so just hold on, hold on. So, this junior detective found out that Miss Rhonda had called into police to say that about four days after the robberies, she was looking at the man who robbed her, the man who came into her home, was walking down the street in front of her house, okay? Police came out, but by the time they got there, this man was gone, you know? He had went about his business wherever he was going, right? And this happened before Timmy was even arrested, okay? They wanna see where Timmy was as this assailant was walking down the street, and it just so happened that not only was Timmy clocked in at work, but during this time, he was sitting down having lunch with a supervisor, okay? so. When Miss Rhonda called in to say that she, um, hey, I'm looking dead at the man who robbed me, who broke into my home. He's walking down the street. Timmy was at work. But at this point, the detectives had already made their minds up. When the junior detective brought this in to his superior, he told him to let it go. And this was never looked into. It was never escalated and it was never brought up in court because Timmy's defense was never made privy to the information. So the senior detective on the case did not do anything about this. Mr. Senior Detectives, I'm not gonna say your name. I know your name, I'm not gonna say your name, but if you ever see this. But the junior detective, he did not stop with his superior. He actually showed up to the courtroom during the trial and, and he told the prosecutor what he knew and the prosecutor told him to go home. And so even with all of this coming to light, y'all know it's way harder getting somebody out of jail than it is to put them in, obviously. Um, whew, Jesus, and Timmy would spend 24 years in prison before his exoneration, okay? He spent his time in prison very diligently. He got two degrees. Bitch, I've been free my whole life and couldn't manage to get one, but... This ain't about me. But Timmy and his family, they stayed steadfast and you know, they hoped that one day he would be released. So the Medill Innocence Project picks up Timothy's case after he had written numerous letters to numerous different organizations, you know, anyone who would just hear him out. Medill Innocence Project, they pick up Timothy's case and not only do they pick up the case but they pay for a new lawyer for timothy and this new lawyer's first step was to go back and talk to witnesses obviously he wanted to talk to his least emotional witness miss Rhonda. and when they go out to talk to miss Rhonda, she says that she has been waiting to get this info off of her chest and how timothy's trial went down has been weighing on her heavy since it happened you know, she says she's been waiting for someone to just come and talk to her. And the first bombshell that Miss Rhonda drops is that when she picked Timothy out of a photo lineup, she was not by herself. She was sitting right next to Kimberly. And Kimberly was kind of coercing her into picking Timothy out of the lineup. Not, and not only was it Kimberly in the room with Ms. Rhonda, it was also Kimberly's mother. So Ms. Rhonda had two emotional women in the room who had just lost somebody very close to them, basically telling her who to pick up out of this lineup. So right off the bat, they're learning that this case was mishandled from the fucking top. Who, who was letting the victim's widow sit next to, while she's trying to pick somebody out of a line? What? Then Ms. Rhonda said that the lead detective, the one who pushed the information aside in the first place that we talked about earlier, 
also coerced her and pointed out Timothy in the lineup. Like, this is the guy, isn't it? So she was coerced. So she was coerced by two people, all right? And that's fucked up. And then she says when it was time for her to pick him up out of like the in-person lineup that she did not want to go in. She says she was so nervous she threw up in the bathroom of the precinct before she went in and picked out Timothy out of like the standing lineup. And she was forced to do that as well. She said she did not want to do it, but the cops told her, you know, we've already come this far. This is our guy, just go in there, pick him out and it'll be over. So the Medill Innocence Project has Rhonda recanting her original statement, her original testimony. She feels horrible. So she's no longer a credible witness. But then the kicker, what's really uncovered is that Detectives were originally looking into a man named Lavelle Thompson, who was only 17 years old at the time of the string of robberies. Lavelle had the pitted acne facial scarring that all of the witnesses, you know, said their attacker had, and he had a history of doing things like this. The Medill Innocence Project learns that Lavelle Thompson was no longer their lead suspect because he was murdered shortly after. He was shot and killed March 1st, 1992, so shortly, not even a week after all of this had happened, he was dead, so he could no longer be their prime suspect. So they had to move on. After Ms. Rhonda recants her statement, the prosecution reaches out with the bullshit. <laughs> They tell Timmy that we will drop the robbery charges, all right? And you've already been in jail. You've already served your time for the murder. So you can get out today if you plead to the murders and we'll drop the robbery charges. Timmy tells them, you got me fucked up. I mean, that's not what he said. That's what he should have said. That's what I would have said. Um, but he says, no, I'm not pleading to something that I did not do. And I'm gonna stay in prison until I can be fully exonerated. Um, I can't say that I would have done the same. I can't, I can't. Mm -mm. I would have took that get out of jail free card, child. Charge me with it, whatever you want. As long as you let me walk out this motherfucker. I don't know. And luckily for Timmy, because of his dedication to his innocence, um, in 2016, a new prosecutor is elected. Are prosecutors, ain't prosecutors elected? I don't know, whatever. Um, and he looks at the case and he says, absolutely the fuck not. Like the, all of this, Everything that's going on with this case is bullshit and he dismisses the case against Timothy all together. So in 2016, he was released after spending 24 years in prison. He was 23 when he went in, so he spent just as much time out of prison as he was in. He missed his father's funeral, his father's passing. He wasn't able to do any of that. He missed birthdays, his nieces and nephews being born. I mean, two decades of his life, two and a half. There's lots of interviews with Timmy of him talking about his situation. He also has an exoneration like program that helps people who were exonerated acclimate back into society. His story is very, very cool, very, very interesting. Highly suggest that you guys go look into it on your own. And unfortunately, Bernard Jimenez, his murder is still technically unsolved because Lavelle Thompson is also deceased. But his family still felt like Timmy was the person who did it. I guess we'll never really know who for sure killed Mr. Bernard. He was 30 years old, very young at the time of his passing. So that also sucks. I mean, this just sucks from top to bottom. You know, it's great that Timmy got out of jail, but you cannot get time back. There's no amount of money that makes 20 years in jail worth it. You know, like that's just terrifying. And like the fact that this whole thing was just like a big butterfly butterfly effect, like if Timothy would have been arrested for like their car 
theft situation, then he wouldn't have been in the mugshot book and they wouldn't have been able to pick him out of the lineup, you know, to begin with. And like, none of this would have ever happened. It's just so crazy how like small things can affect the traje trajectory of your life. Like if he wouldn't have been in the car with his friend that day, if they wouldn't have went down to Marquette Beach, none of this would have happened. And because all of these robberies happened in and around the same time, like if, and because whoever was doing this was attacking people as they were getting out of their cars, making their way inside, if Timmy and his family would have gotten back earlier, maybe they would have been a victim of this assailant as well. You just never know. It is so nuts. As always, I would love to know how you guys are feeling about this one in the comments down below. That's how the bite mark happened. But that Lisa left Jennifer alive and that Jim must have returned to the apartment after. All right guys, so for today's case, we are in Breckenridge, Colorado, which is about an hour and 30 minutes outside of Denver and higher up into the mountains than Denver is, okay? So on the night in question, it is January 6, 1982, when we are at the home of Bobby Joe and her husband, Jeff. Bobby Joe and Jeff have a difficult last name. I'm gonna put it on the screen. Bobby Joe called in to her husband Jeff to say that she was gonna go out with some friends from work after work because she had gotten a promotion that day and she was gonna go out to celebrate. So they get off the phone and Bobby Joe is out with her friends. Jeff makes his way to bed. And he assumes, you know, that she'll wake him up to let him know she's home whenever she makes it. But Jeff wakes up at about 2 a.m. and realizes that Bobby Joe still has not made it home. So Jeff gets out of bed to go look for his wife. Now, she was supposed to be like catching a ride or hitchhiking home. And it was a super cold night. It's cold, obviously, in Colorado this time of the year anyway, but this was a night where like the snowfall was super heavy. And so he wanted to go out to see if he could find her. You know, maybe she was never able to get the ride that she needed. So Jeff heads out towards town to look for Bobby Joe. He drove a ways but couldn't find her. And then he decided to stop at the friend's house who she was supposed to be out with that night because he knew where they lived, okay? So he pulled up on them woke them up out of their sleep in the middle of the night looking for Bobby Joe. And they said that they didn't know where she was or how she got home because Bobby Joe had actually left the bar before everybody else, right before 10 p.m. And she said that she was going to hitchhike home, which was not out of the ordinary in this like mountain town. People hitchhiked a lot and Bobby Joe herself often hitchhiked it wasn't out of the ordinary y'all know everybody in the 80s hitchhiked unfortunately so jeff's next step is to head into breckenridge police to report bobby joe missing but of course police aren't going to do anything about this right away they tell jeff to wait 24 hours so jeff heads back home with his hands tied to hopefully, you know, be waiting for Bobby Joe whenever she does show up. And he is home until about 8 a.m. When someone calls in to their home phone to say that they have found Bobby Joe's driver's license in their driveway. Right on the edge of the driveway, like somebody had probably tossed it out of the car while they were driving, you know? And so obviously this is alarming and this driveway that the driver's license was found on was actually like the driveway into a ranch and this ranch was about in the middle between Breckenridge and Denver so far away from her home so they're wondering you know why Billy Joe's ID was found so they're wondering why Billy Joe's 
Bobby Joe. I might say Billy. I have an aunt named Billy, so I might get the names confused, but her name is Bobby Joe. So they're wondering why Bobby Joe's ID was found on the side of the road, like it had been tossed out. So since police wanted to wait 24 hours, her friends in the area and her husband decided to set out looking for her on their own. Now, unfortunately, Bobby Jo, she didn't have any family in the area. She and Jeff had decided to move to Colorado from Wisconsin, where they both were from, for like a fresh start, okay? And they had been in Colorado for about two years before this happened. And I say it was just them to put emphasis on the fact that her husband, Jeff, really had to rally the troops to get people out looking for her. He called all the friends that they had in the area so they could get together and start looking for Bobby Joe. So they start to head towards where her ID was found. And as they're on the way there, they're looking out of the windows to see what else they can see on the way there if her stuff you know, was being thrown out of a window. Now it was super cold, super snowy, like I said. So as they're looking out of the window, anything sitting directly on top of the snow, the fresh white snow is gonna stick out like a sore thumb. And eventually they do pass a bright blue speck in the snow as they're headed towards this ranch, okay? And once they make their way to this big blue speck, it's a backpack and it's Bobby Joe's backpack, okay? Jeff was there, he recognized her backpack and what they also realized is that there's no footprints to or from the backpack. So this backpack, like her ID, was just thrown out of somebody's window. They also find Bobby Joe's snow gloves that she wore and those gloves unfortunately were covered in blood so they find her backpack they find her bloody snow glove and there's also some kleenex found at the scene and since they were finding bobby joe's stuff out in the snow, a group of her friends decide to set out on skis to like search deep into the snow off of the highways to see if they can come across anything. And it doesn't take her friends on skis long before they do come across a body in the snow. And initially, because she is found out in the snow, they think that this is an accident, that she wound up out here, got lost, couldn't make her way out of the snow and she you know succumbed to the weather but, but once her body is picked up out of the snow and they can get a better look there's lots of blood underneath her body and they realize that Bobby Joe had been shot near her body they find a orange sock like those fluffy socks that you get during the holiday time I have some on right now, but I don't want to pick my whole leg up, but y'all know the fluffy socks that you get during the holidays. There was an orange one of those found near her body as well as her like key ring. She had like a safety key ring, like heavy key ring that you could knock somebody out with that Jeff had actually bought for her to protect herself. That was found at the scene. Once they get like the corners van on the scene and they get her into a body bag Jeff identifies her right then and there so they bring Bobby Joe in for an autopsy and they realize that she was shot twice in the back seemingly as she was running away she stumbled for a few feet in the snow and then she you know fell and that's how her body was found she had also been zip tied around her wrist i almost forgot the word for wrist i was about to say your ankles on your arms i forgot that word for 2.5 seconds okay what also stuck out to emmy's once they took her clothes off took her shoes off the sock found at the scene was not her sock so the first person they decide to look into obviously is jeff 
her husband. You know, Jeff doesn't really have an alibi. He says he was home sleeping and then he woke up, realized that she wasn't home. And then he set out to look for her, but that's all he did, okay? And Jeff, of course, denies having any involvement in what happened to Bobby Joe. But before they can even look into him good enough, another young blonde hitchhiker is reported missing. This woman's name is Annette Sneed, okay? Now, Annette was someone else who was in the area pretty much by herself. She had moved to Colorado from Ohio looking for like a fresh start. She worked two jobs. She was a bartender and she worked at the desk at a hotel. She worked two jobs because she was trying to put herself and she worked two jobs because she was trying to get into flight attendant school. So. Annette had a good solid plan for her life. Now, Annette was reported missing by a coworker that knew Annette was practically in Breckenridge by herself. She didn't have any family here. So after Annette did not show up for work, this Good Samaritan coworker called police to let them know that she was missing. And, and Annette's friends and family in Ohio learned that she's missing through detectives in Breckenridge, okay? So in a few days time, detectives have two women that were missing and one wound up deceased. And their main concern is that if they both disappeared around the same time and they suffered the same fate, that if Annette was killed around the time Bobby Joe was, that they probably would not find Annette until spring and summer when the, st the snow started to melt because she would just be under feet after feet after feet of snow. It would be very difficult for them to find her right now. And Annette was last seen the same day that Bobby Joe was last seen, okay? Right off the bat, detectives think that the two cases are definitely connected, but all they have in the beginning is a hunch. Thinking the cases are probably connected, they asked Jeff if he knows Annette, if he had seen her before, and he says no, that is until her picture comes out in the newspaper. And he calls in to detectives to say, well, yeah, I do know Annette. I gave her a ride in November. So a few months prior, he said he picked her up hitchhiking gave her his business card but that's it and detectives are like okay that's weird so detectives are like okay that's a weird co-winky dink and they ask jeff if he if he'd be willing to take a polygraph test and he does take a polygraph test and he does pass the polygraph test and unfortunately detectives really don't have anywhere else to go they don't have any idea where Annette is, if she is alive, if she's not. And so time passes. Annette's family even comes to Colorado on their own to do their own like investigative work, but nobody comes up with anything. And then in February of 1982, a woman comes forward with a similar story to Bobby Joe and Annette. She says that she was out waiting for the bus and as she was waiting for the bus, a man approached her in a pickup truck offering to give her a ride. And as they're driving down the road, this man pulls over, pulls a hammer out on her and starts to threaten her with the hammer. He SAs this woman and then She's able to turn herself loose, get out of this van, I mean, get out of this truck and start running. And she's able to get away from him. And obviously she goes directly into police to tell them what had happened to her. Luckily, this man is driving a really old raggedy pickup truck that the woman gives them a great description of. And detectives are actually able to find this old rusty pickup truck. And it's at a trailer park 
And so they get an ID for the man that this truck belongs to. And this man's name is Thomas Luther. So they've got a violent offender. They scoop him up and immediately start asking him about the girls, Annette and Bobby Joe, where he was when they disappeared, all of the things, because they're thinking this is probably their guy, somebody with the same MO, okay? Tom Luther denies, but coworkers say that he missed work the day after the women disappeared. So Thomas is charged in the connection to the woman who survived, okay, sentenced to 10 years, but they don't have enough to mix him up or wrap him up with Annette and Bobby Joe. And there's no movement in those cases until the snow starts to melt in June, July, okay? It's actually the weekend of the 4th of July. A family is visiting their summer home for the holiday, okay? And the son of the family, who is 13 years old at the time, makes his way down to a creek so he can go fishing. He always, he always does this when they go out to the summer home. He takes his fishing pole, his line, his bait, everything by himself to go out fishing. But he don't catch no fish. He finds a body. Obviously, the little boy, he's only 13. He's freaked the fuck out. So he starts taking off running back towards the home. But he does leave rocks. He's smart enough to leave rocks before he just completely takes off running so he can mark his place of where he is so he can lead people back to where this body was found okay because of the way the body is dressed and like winter clothes bundled up real tight they know the body has been here for a while probably you know when this area was covered in snow and this creek fills up with water that runs off from the snow up higher in the mountains so the water is super cold the body is very well preserved because she spent so much time in the snow and then she was in this cold, frigid water and it is identified as Annette. And they're able to finally connect these two cases, Bobby Joe and Annette, for sure, because the orange sock that was found with Bobby Joe's body, Annette is wearing the other one. So detectives are trying to figure out how did these women both go missing at the same time on the same day and both end up dead like was somebody out there stalking women and decided to pick two up and murder them back to back like what is going on because annette as same as bobby joe was shot in the back presumably as she was trying to run away from whoever had done this to them so this elusive orange sock was annette to belong to annette it was actually sent from her mom in like a care package so now they have like the origin of this orange sock so they think that whatever happened to the two ladies, it happened to Annette first, and then some kind of way, once Bobby Joe got mixed up in the bunch, she got mixed up with the orange sock as well. And they think that Annette left her sock behind, like trying to flee, like trying to hurry up and get away from whatever she was trying to get away from. And she just did not have time to put her other sock on. And remember how Jeff said he had met Annette a few months prior and given her a business card on her person in the coat she was found in was Jeff's business card. So this obviously makes detectives circle back around to him because why would the business card still be in her pocket if you gave it to her months and months ago? It was just weird. So they go back to Jeff. They circle back and give him a second polygraph test to ask him specifically about Annette, but he passes this polygraph test again. But the main issue in this case is that we just don't have the technology that we do today. So back in the 80s, there's just not much they can do. So with Bobby Joe, there is shell casings, bullets found underneath her body. And remember, Tom, Tom has a gun, but ballistics, at this stage in the 80s cannot match the bullets to the gun. So that's a link that's just up in the air. The blood found on Bobby Joe's glove that was found near her backpack, they can tell what blood type it is, but they don't know whose blood it is because of DNA, okay? We're not there yet. Jeff doesn't have a cell phone to pinpoint his location at the time that the women disappeared, okay? So there's just a bunch of leads that are up in the air because in the 80s, they don't have no technology. 
So both cases stall for decades, okay? A task force is formed to kind of keep the case alive and breathing. There's a couple leads here and there. They learn that a man by the name of Tracy Petrozelli was in the area at the time and during this time he was on like a crime spree but none of the crimes in his crime spree were sexual in nature. He was like carjacking and shooting and stuff like that. They also look back and see that Tracy was staying in the hotel that Annette worked at during this time. But ultimately, Tracy is ruled out. He's like, you know, I'm already in prison. I don't have no reason to lie. These two women, I ain't do nothing like this. He said he wasn't a sexual predator. He didn't do stuff like that. So Tracy is whittled off their list, okay? And then detectives just end up going around in circles. So remember how I always say people need to stay in jail? So Thomas gets out of jail early. Thomas Luther from before gets out of jail early. He does not serve his full 10 years. And then just shortly after he's released, a woman that he has dealings with, her name is Cheryl, disappears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she is last seen with Thomas Luther. So they are looking for him after Cheryl disappears. They can't find him. All right. Then this task force gets word of this. So they looking for him too. They end up finding him in West Virginia in prison because he was in prison for a separate sexual assault. So this man has gotten out of jail within a couple of months for one sexual assault. One lady disappears and then he ends up in jail for another sexual assault. In West Virginia, they ask him about Annette and Bobby Joe. He says, it's not me, but at this point, he acting a fool. Do we really believe him? We don't know, okay? We just don't know. As DNA progresses into the late 90s, early 2000s, they decide to resubmit the bloody glove, the Kleenex, and Bobby Joe's backpack in for DNA testing. And they find Bobby Joe's DNA, but they also find a male DNA that they can test against the suspects they have. They tested against Tom Luther, they tested against Jeff, they tested against Tracy, any and everybody that they had on their list and this DNA does not come back to any of the men who were originally suspects. But they do finally have this man's DNA. In 2002, they entered this random male DNA into the CODIS system to see if they pull back a match, but they don't. So now that they have this random DNA, all they can really do is sit on it until they have another suspect, okay? But luckily, the Golden State Killer is caught before they find another suspect in this murder. And y'all know where we're going with this, the genetic genealogy, all right? If by chance you're unfamiliar with the Golden State Killer and how they eventually, after years and years and years, found out who he was, is that they had his DNA sample, okay? They took his DNA sample, put it into like one of those 23andMe websites to find anybody that was related to him. You can find super, super distant relatives and then you build the family tree backwards and link it into people in the area where the crimes were committed and you rule your suspects out. I'm pretty sure in the Golden State Killer case, they had ruled him all the way down to like his siblings. They knew it was male DNA, so it had to be one of the brothers. And that's how they caught the Golden State Killer. And this is exactly what they do with the DNA they found on Bobby Joe's belongings. Put that thing down, flip it and reverse it, build a family tree backwards, and they narrow it down to siblings. And this is in 2020. And y'all, listen to what I'm about to say. Okay, they narrow it down to a family that has two sons. They take these two sons' names, check the background just to see what pops up. Alan Phillips was one of the brothers, okay? Alan still lived in Colorado. His brother had moved away a while back. On the night that the women disappeared, there is a news article about Alan Phillips because he is stranded in the snow, in his pickup truck. 
He was stranded at the top of Quinella Pass and he used his headlights to flag down a passing plane, okay? The passing plane lets people on the ground know that he's stranded, he needs help. They send sheriffs up. Sheriffs can't get to him, but in the type of vehicles they have, so they send fire up to get this man because he was stuck in the snow. What stands out when they look into the police report of this night is that this man had a really bad gash on his head. He was bleeding everywhere. He told sheriffs on the scene that he fell, hit his head as he was trying to push his truck out of the snow. But they know the person that attacked the women that night were was bleeding, okay, because they have his blood. So detectives are like, ain't no damn way this man kidnapped, murdered two women on the same night, and then got his motherfucking truck stuck in the snow, flashed his headlights to a passing plane. We came and rescued his ass, not knowing that he had just committed literally a double fucking murder. There's even newspaper articles about the two incidences, the women disappearing and this man being found up at the top of Guanella Pass who flagged down the airplane so he could be rescued right next to each other. And detectives are like, there is no way, there is no way that this is our guy, Alan. You know, they're thinking there's absolutely no way that sheriff and firemen risk their lives to go save this man, unlodge his truck out of the snow after he had just murdered two people. There's no way. And had he gotten stuck up at Guanella Pass trying to get rid of evidence that he had collected on his little evil escapades. And they know that Bobby Joe was the second victim. So they're thinking because they found Bobby Joe's like big safety keychain. I'm going to put a picture of it in. It's like a big ass hook on her key ring um, that Jeff had made for her. They think Bobby Joe smacked the hell out of his ass before he killed her. Then, 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 they see that in the 70s, okay, Allen was arrested for assault because he had picked up a hitchhiker, a female, pulled up to an abandoned cabin and started beating her in a rock and started beating her with a really big rock, okay? But she survived, she escaped, so he had spent a year in prison for that, but got out and was able to go on to kill two more people. That's why we need to leave people in jail. But they all, but they obviously want to collect his DNA, match it, okay, to the DNA found on Bobby Joe's belongings. And they decide to stalk him the same way officers in California stalked the Golden State Killer. But what they realized is that maybe Allen had heard about the Golden, how they caught the Golden State Killer as well. And this motherfucker stopped throwing his trash out, okay? They followed Alan, stalked him for weeks, waiting for him to put his trash out to the road so they can go through it, find like cups, straws, napkins, tissues, hair on a brush, anything in his trash. He stopped throwing his trash out. Where is your trash, Alan? Where is the trash? So they start searching, stalking this man every which way, trying to see when he gonna throw some trash away. They end up following him to a Sonic. After he leaves Sonic to get his food, he goes to the post office. He sits in the parking lot of the post office, eats his food, and goes into the post office with the Sonic bag, does not leave the post office with the Sonic bag. So they know the Sonic bag is inside the post office. They go into the post office, go through the trash, find his Sonic bag and collect his DNA from his Sonic trash. And after 40 years, 40 freaking years, they finally can test the DNA to connect somebody to these women's murder. And they finally got him. The DNA matches and they're able to arrest Alan for their murder of Annette and Bobby Joe. 40 years after the fact. And y'all, this case did not go to trial until August of last year, 2022. 
And so they theorized that Alan was just a sicko that liked to attack women and that maybe Annette got the best of him. She was able to get out of the vehicle and flee. And instead of chasing after her, he shot her. He went back into town to look for his second victim, came across Bobby Joe. He zip tied Bobby Joe, unlike Annette, maybe because he figured since Annette got away, the second one would. So he did a little bit more so that Bobby Joe wouldn't get away. But Bobby Joe put up even more of a fight and clocked him in the head with that big ass thing that was on her keys. And that is probably how she got out of the vehicle and started to flee. And unfortunately, instead of catching up to her, he decided to shoot her in the back. And if she wouldn't have whacked him in the head, he wouldn't have bled. We would have had his DNA on her belongings and we probably would have never solved this case. So both of these women were able to get away from him and if he didn't have a gun, they'd probably still be alive today. And in trial, this is the story that the prosecution brings forward. Of course, the defense brings up Jeff as a possible suspect. Jeff just can't catch a break. But he is found guilty, okay, on all counts. Get this man the fuck up out of here. And unfortunately, Alan Phillips didn't even spend a year in prison before he himself okay got himself up out of here but technically his case he as a person is still under investigation they figure he's probably done this to more people and they are actively looking into sexual assault attacks kidnappings of hitchhikers that happened during the time and in the 40 years that he was free that they could possibly connect him to so yeah that was a doozy of a case wasn't it Shout out to Bobby Joe for knocking him upside his head. That's the least of what he deserved. And it is so crazy to think after murdering two people, he ended up stranded and needed rescuing his damn self. Talk about instant karma, not instant enough. Imagine if he would have died up there on Guanella Pass after doing what he did. That, chef's kiss. This man stole a car and upon realizing there was a baby inside, he returned the baby, scolded the parents for leaving the car unattended with a baby inside and proceeded to steal the car again. My first question is, is he from Detroit? The reason I ask if he's from Detroit, my hometown, is because if you look at his mugshot, that is a face of no regret. That is a face of, I will do this again if you let me out of here. As a matter of fact, I might steal your car next. That's what this face is. Now, a lot of people might be like, he's stupid for, for coming back and scolding the parents. No, what he was doing was proving a point. It was the principle of the whole thing. He wasn't going to come back. Not only am I returning your baby, because that's an extra charge, but I'm telling you why you're out of control for leaving your baby in the car. I shouldn't have to tell you how to raise this baby. Now, I was in the middle of stealing this car. I'm going to finish that. But don't leave that baby outside again. Also, is it just me or does a wife, a white wife beater just signify crime? White tank top. You can't say nothing. Scolded is just such a funny word. Is it considered stealing again if he's still in the process of the first steal? It's not like he stole it, parked it somewhere, you got it back, and he stole it. That's stealing again. What he did was continued the first crime, which, you know, shouldn't be anything added to his sentence if you are thinking like I'm thinking. <sighs> that is a wrap on today's case. As always, leave your thoughts, comments, and opinions in the comments down below, and I'll see y'all next time. Bye, guys.